Okay, I think of
I'll be able to hit that again in public. Um, welcome for tonight, Thursday, September 3rd, school board meeting. If I could please have the attendance. Ms. Giftos? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Did I miss someone? Yes. And Ms. Layton? I think she's there. Did she not hear me? Maybe not. Sarah? Well, looks like she may be dropped off of yeah. audio. Hmm. Okay. Hopefully she'll come back. Right. And Mr. Bennett. Here. Thank you. Sorry. No, we're all good. All right. You can join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. 4.0. Are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Seeing none, moving into 5.0, public comments on agenda items. Um, I'm going to start with a letter that we had received today. And this is from Erin Keller, chemistry teacher at the high school. Hello, I'm writing to express my opinion as a staff member at Scarborough High School and a member of the SEA about opening schools next week. We have been spending time this week trying to make plans for a hybrid teaching model. This model is twice as much work as teaching fully in person or fully remotely. The hybrid model means I must split my attention during every class between students on a screen at home and students right in front of me. Speaking for myself, I am not prepared to do as well with this model as I have always been at the start of school years for the past 14 years. I could use at least one more week to prepare my materials and to learn how to use tech tools. It is not the best, in the best interest of students if I cannot do my job properly because I do not have the skills or the preparation time I need in order to do so. The fact is, I do not believe that we'll be able to open schools safely, and so I don't believe we should open to in-person instruction at all. The hybrid model is complex and a severe logistical challenge. It comes with increased risk to the health of the faculty, staff, and our families. We, not the students, will bear the brunt of any outbreaks of COVID-19. We have no way to provide testing to employees or to students, and so we'll be operating in the dark until it is too late. Teachers could do a better job with a synchronous remote model, and we would all be safer. If you will not move immediately to a remote model, then the union's request for more time to prepare is reasonable, and I urge you to consider it. Thank you for your time and attention. Okay. Moving into other comments. Tamara, I have uh, moved you to talk. You just need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Tamara Murray. I live at 15 Barry Road and have been with Scarborough Public Schools for eight years. I am a school bus driver and I am vice president of the educational support personnel for the Scarborough Education Association. I am requesting that the board consider our school start date of September 8th and to change it, to give us at least another week. We are not ready and we do not feel safe. Yesterday, the bus department spent time reviewing cleaning protocols for our fleet. More than three weeks ago, we were told the district had purchased electrostatic sprayers to disinfect buses between runs. Yesterday, administration asked for volunteers from our bus drivers to take an online certification class in order to operate them. This was yesterday. We requested vacuum cleaners because research shows sweeping releases COVID-19 particles everywhere, on seats, on windows, and on us. Yesterday, we were told they had not come in yet. Today, we asked for an update and found out that they have never been ordered. Next week, we are supposed to start transporting students. Some of us will be doing at least three runs 
per day because K through two will be released at noon. We will not have a bus aid as recommended by the Department of Education to make sure that kiddos are staying masked and separated. We cannot physically see most of our K-2 students in their seats. The executive board of the SEA has been meeting regularly with Colt. Mr. Prince has expressed to us that we are building the plane as we are flying it. This does not bring comfort to us. The transportation department is going into the school year understaffed. One spare driver is due to ship out in October and another spare driver is a pilot. Our department represents some of the oldest employees in the district, many with underlying conditions that fit the COVID target group. We miss our kids and we wanna be back in the driver's seat, but we also wanna be safe and we wanna go home to our families too. Please reconsider and delay the start. Land the plane and finish building it. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Martha, you just need to unmute yourself. Thank you, I trust you can hear me? Yes. My name is Martha Olive. I'm a resident of Scarborough on Sextant Lane and I am also a veteran teacher of 24 years, 17 of which in Scarborough. Currently I'm employed as a reading teacher at Wentworth School. First of all, I would like to applaud the school board members who at the last board meeting noticed and mentioned the mismatch between what the Scarborough Education Association's statement said and what each administrator in the school department stated. I have a question to pose to all of you on the board. Did you get to the bottom of that discrepancy? If you have not yet, I think you should. I think the parents and students in our town deserve that much. If you truly value and respect your teachers, you would have searched for and listened to the why, because when it comes to the health and safety of all the children and staff members in our town, nothing is more important. Very smart, talented, caring teachers are trying to be up to speed, but their hands are tied when it comes to safety and training videos that are inaccessible. The Wentworth staff has not even been able to watch them and school opens next Tuesday. Your teachers love and care about your kids and about their own children and families. They are caught between a rock and a hard place and their stress levels are elevating. Please care about what your frontline responders in your schools are screaming from the trenches and do not just placidly believe what you are told in the interest of hearing proper sounding popular responses. Your teachers have little to gain personally other than their own health and safety by bringing these issues into the light. They do so for the health and safety of all. To say all is ready and set for Tuesday is just lip service. Teachers do not like hearing from administrators that we are kind of building the plane as we go. That would not put anyone's mind at ease on an airplane either, and it is not humorous. Talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. Show your teachers that you trust and believe that they have the best interests of health and safety for your children at heart. Politics and pandemics do not mix well, and this is not a time to put anyone's safety in the slightest bit of jeopardy. Thank you. Thank you. Jody, I've unmuted you. You just need to unmute yourself, I believe. Do you want to try it again? I'm gonna pop you back on mute and we're gonna try to unlock you in a moment. Casey? Hi. Hello. 
Hi, so my name is Casey and I'm a resident of Scarborough. I live at 14 Teal Point Drive. Um, and you may also remember me because I am the senior student representative to the Maine State Board of Education. Um, just keeping that in mind, I'd like to say before I start speaking that um, what I'm about to say is solely my opinion and doesn't represent the opinion of the state board, the DOE, or anything else at the state level. Um, I'm just here to speak to some of my thoughts on school this year. Um, in light of what Mr. Keller had said and some other SEA representatives, I'd just like to say that I'm in support of pushing back the start of school. Um, and I truly believe that uh, at least at the high school level, our teachers really do have the students' best interest at heart. Um, and I just feel that if this is what our teachers are asking for, then we should respect um, the quality of the education over the quantity of the education, especially during these times. Um, I've been a part of a lot of different dialogue about this. And while there's always disagreement over is the amount of instructional time our students are getting and how many days and hours and minutes that they have, um, really important over how well prepared our educators are. And in my semi-professional having sat in on so many discussions opinion, um, I truly believe that our teachers are not prepared for what they're going into. And the fact that they have the strength and the courage to speak up and ask for this time just shows their integrity and we should be able to give that to them. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Denise, if you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me, Leanne? I can. Um, hello, my name is Denise Blaine. Um, I live in Buxton, but I'm a Scarborough employee. Um, I will let everyone know that I'm also um, a union representative. Um, but tonight I'm speaking strictly as um, a 19 year employee. Um, I've just ended probably the toughest three days of my career. And I'm gonna try not to cry and I'm gonna try to be eloquent. But at 2.15 today, I sent the board an email. 2.15 is, is about 20 minutes before the end of my contracted day. And at 2.15, um, I walked out around my building and I want you to know what I saw. I saw custodians scrambling to get desks out of the hallway so students could legit, legitimately walk the hallway separated enough. At 2.15, this was happening. At 2.15, I received an email from my administration with QR codes that are essential for tracking students whereabouts through the building for, tr for COVID tracking practices. At 2.15, that was sent to me. At 2.15, I had people delivering my masks for my students. At 2.15, I walked by what should be the nurse's new office, so ha they have a healthy office and a sick office that was still being constructed. At 2.15, plexiglass dividers were still going up in various offices where students would need to be, such as the guidance office. Guidance office, where a lot of our students are probably gonna end up because they are managing their mental health. At 2.15, before we leave the building and get ready to walk in to students on Tuesday, on Tuesday, I wouldn't be able to look a parent in the eye right now and say, I can keep your kids safe. I know that when that bell rings, they're gonna walk in that hallway and not cluster. I'm not gonna have, I'm not gonna be able to say that. And this community is trusting me to do that. So I want you to hear me when I say that I don't think we're ready. Am I ready personally as a teacher? No. But will I do it? Will I walk in there on Tuesday and put my fake face on and pretend that I have it all together? Absolutely, because that's why I chose to do this. But I can't tell you that we have done everything that we can possibly do and we're ready to go. 
I'm going to quote my friend Tamara, land this plane and get it together and do it right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have another public comment that had come in. This is from Joellen Clive, technology instructional coach. We all know it takes a lot of work to open school each fall. And we all know that this year is exponentially more work to open school. Health and safety trainings on new protocols to keep our students safe. Technology trainings to learn the platforms in which we will be delivering instruction on remote days. Defining what hybrid instruction looks like. All of this takes even longer when done in online virtual meetings. I'm incredibly thankful for the additional time that we have been given to prepare for the school year. Mine's off. Does anyone else have sound on? No. It's coming from Kelly's computer, then. Hmm? Okay. Still going, huh? Mine is off completely. Oh, I'm completely off. Okay. All right. All right. Let me give it another shot, see what happens. Um, sorry, hold on a second. <laughs> Looks like everything's off. If I could interject, Kelly's laptop has the mic turned on. I did. Okay, I think we got you. Okay. All right, I think we're good. Thank you, Don. Thank you so much. Um. Joellen, because it stopped in the middle, I am going to start yours over again. We all know it takes a lot of work to open school each fall, and we all know that this year is exponentially more work to open school. Health and safety trainings are new protocols to keep our students safe. Technology trainings to learn the platforms in which we will be delivering instruction on remote days. Defining what hybrid instruction looks like. All of this takes even longer when done in online virtual meetings. I'm incredibly thankful for the additional time that we have been given to prepare for the school year. However, it is just not enough. We are not ready to open school on Tuesday, September 8th. Staff have been working day in, day out, early mornings, late nights, weekends. Yes, we typically say we're not ready to open, but this year it's not just about finishing our bulletin boards, labeling folders, and assigning lockers. This year it's about remotely teaching students to connect to a Google Meet. How do we structure our instructional time with remote and in-person students? How do we build a cohesive community with our students across multiple cohorts? What is the protocol for helping students with technology issues while they are in person? How do families and students get tech help when they are remote? How is parent pickup going to work with a dozen buses and hundreds of parents arriving at the same time? These are just the lingering questions and don't include the policies, procedures, and protocols that we've already learned about, been informed of, or worked out. When revising the school calendar back in July, the board was receptive to the idea of adding more staff days prior to student arrival if necessary. I believe that it is necessary. I know that it is late to change the calendar now, but if we are truly looking at what is in the best interest of our students and we need to consider the preparedness of our schools and staff, please consider delaying the first student day to allow more time to accommodate these massive changes to the way our schools operate. Thank you. All 
right, April. We had another one come in, Leanne, from um, Courtney Thomason. I have it in front of me if you'd like me to read it. Yes, please. Okay, you did have it in front of me. It says, hello, I am writing you to you today to express my opinion as a staff member, special education teacher K-12, an SEA member and a parent of a child in the Scarborough and parent of a child in the Scarborough School District. I believe the administration has worked tirelessly with training and informational meetings. However, I am concerned that the district as a whole is ready to safe and efficiently open on Tuesday, September 8th. Speaking for myself, I am not prepared to begin teaching and supporting my students until multiple pieces out of my control are in place, which currently they are not. Therefore, I urge you to reconsider the start time of our school. Thank you, Courtney Thompson. Thank you. anyone else um if there's anyone else who would like to have a public comment i'll leave it open for just another moment um so i can see if jody had come back in okay all right seeing none of, no other comments i'm going to go ahead and close public comment for tonight moving into 6.0 the superintendent's report Thank you, Leanne. Uh, I'd like to talk about student enrollment. Uh, we do this every year, every month, just to update everybody about the numbers in the district with our students. Um, I think what I'll do is kind of go from left to right, and starting with the high school. We currently have, at this time, 959 students. And a year ago, we had 988. We have currently, to be homeschooled, three students, and um, last year with homeschooling, we had 10. We're planning with the 100% remote that we will have 71 students, and our hybrid will be 888. Going to the middle school, we currently have 718 students. A year ago, we had 698. Currently, homeschool students at the middle school, we have 12, where a year ago we had eight. We anticipate 100 students will be in the remote mode, and with a hybrid at the middle school, we'll have 618. At Wentworth School, currently we have 636. A year ago, we had 658. Homeschool currently, we have 16 at Wentworth. And a year ago at Wentworth, we had four. 100% remote will be at Wentworth 81 students. And hybrid, we anticipate 555 at Wentworth. As we go to Blue Point School, currently we have 202 students. Last year, we had 200. We did not have any homeschool students registered at this time, nor did we have any last year at this time. 100% uh, remote at Blue Point, 35 students, and with a hybrid, it will be 167. At Eight Corners Elementary School, we currently have 224. A year ago, we had 242. Homeschool currently, 28 students, a year ago we had five. As we look at the 100% remote, we have 56 students that have signed up for that, and our hybrid is 168. The last school, Pleasant Hill, currently we have 189 students, a year ago we had 205. We do not have any homeschool students currently, nor do, did we have any a year ago. When we look at the 100% remote, we anticipate 37 students, and our hybrid will be 152 students. So as we total that all up, currently we have 2,928 students within the district. A year ago, we had 290, 
2,991. Total for homeschool is 59 students. The last year it was 27 students total. And as we look at the 100% remote, we anticipate 380 students and a hybrid will be 2,559. So in a nutshell, if there's a difference with enrollment, we're down currently 63 students, but we all know that a lot of students typically come in the first day who have moved into the district and they'll end up registering their child. So I anticipate that number going up for the month of September, hopefully. And that's enrollment. A quick question sure. with respect to enrollment. Um, is there a deadline that if parents are moving their children to private schools that they need to notify the district? I think they can do that at any point in time. If a parent really wanted to do that, they could pull their child out and register. So that's typical practice. I just didn't know if people didn't maybe didn't know that if they had moved their children to another district, did they know to let us know oh, that point. they had withdrawn? It generally comes through a request for records that we'll get in our schools. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Nick? Um, I, I, I apologize for not knowing this off the top of my head, but last year, academic, last year's academic calendar, we had started school uh, at this point, right? So that's important to note, I think, in public because I, it's, it's very good to compare the same date, calendar date to calendar date, but one of the things it's so important is to realize any anomalies that might exist in that year that would impact that statistic. So comparing September 1 this year to September 1 last year is the right thing to do with the caveat that we know, as Sandy said, people come in and register as of the first day of school, maybe the first couple days. And at that this point last year, that had already happened and hasn't this year. So this could be artificially a little bit low. I guess I'm also wondering if when COVID is a thing of the past, which I know we all cannot wait for, if some of these homeschooled students, particularly in the younger grades, which is where the vast majority of this is coming from, will return to the school district as opposed to staying home schooled. I, I know I've heard anecdotally from some families that they've decided to keep their younger students home for a year and then hope to get them back into the social aspect of school when this is all over. So those two things combined could really impact our enrollment. And I know that uh, people in town are watching our enrollment closely. So I wanted to point those things out. Thank you. Oh, 6.2. Mr. Souza, this is all about you. You just need to unmute yourself and if you wouldn't mind popping back on video. Good evening. You guys hear me all right? I can. Great. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to come forward tonight and just kind of tell you where we are um, and kind of where the conversations have gone um, with the central office staff so far. Um, over the last couple of weeks, we've been trying to address the shortfall in childcare. Um, as soon as we learned, the school had decided to go to a hybrid model um, and knowing the restrictions based on space, totally understandable within the, within the school and that non in-person day students would not be allowed in the building we started looking for alternate space to kind of hold care. Um, presently, we've had two workshops with um, town council and town management. Um, and we have a uh, letter of intent signed with the House of Lights over on Payne Road. Um, and we'll be working through the last parts of that, hopefully to get approval next week uh, to move forward with this um, uh, full daycare. Our proposal is to go from seven in the morning to six, like we do with our normal summer camp um, and offering um, not only enrichment and, and, and recreational activities, but to try to aid and get the kids in the right spaces to help with, you know, synchronized learning of school. Um, we're working through all those things right now, space challenges, um, all the safety and health uh, guidelines, um, getting the tech up and running. Um, so we get a lot of balls in the air. Um, and we've been kind of crash course in this for the last two weeks. Um, we had modeled our program after our existing. In May, we had 210 pre-registered kids for childcare. Uh, we stopped registration at that time once COVID hit with the uncertainties. Um, and so we used this target group as our known. Uh, and presently we have 
um, about 72 people that are interested in this program from that existing group. Um, uh, tonight, I'm here before you, one to give you the kind of little update, but um, last week, some more funding came out through um, the states, um, the uh, COVID relief funds, and they're, they're looking towards uh, day programs and um, sat down and talked with Sandy and then with Sandy and Diane and Kate um, and asked if the school, because it has to be submitted by the school, if we put this together, the school would um, submit this grant on our behalf. The grant is set up where you can have a partner in this because a lot of schools aren't able to offer uh, child care. And I understand um, um, that the school, school board staff are, are the number one goal is to get kids uh, back in the building safely. And so um, we felt like this was our duty to try to take on, work with the school uh, and try to get as many kids in uh, the best environment as possible. Um, Presently, I've submitted our, our stuff to Kate for review. Um, we are looking for things in this application um, that could supplement um, our existing operation, if so approved next week. Uh, things like increased staff, increased custodial supplies, a um, little more technology, um, uh, the extra supplies needed to keep the kids uh, single spaced and, and single staffed as far as uh, supplies go. Um, and then also um, there's a meal component to it and the snacks. Uh, presently our model and funding was around having the kids bring their own food so we didn't have to worry about all the restrictions uh, and, and then food handling. And so snacks would be a piece that we may look at for the, for the whole day piece. Um, it's a quick turnaround. Everything is due tomorrow by five. It's a two day review next week and we should know by the 11th whether we are a recipient of that. Um, just to kind of paint the picture on the way the grant works, this grant is targeting school districts that are 35% or greater, free and reduced lunch. At last count, Scarborough was 12.7. And so the state indicated that they would be focusing on that target group. And if there was funds left after that, then they would look mm -hmm. at districts under that. Um, with that advice, um, you know, presently, the, the draft that I have, um, then I'll follow up with Kate in the morning, we're at about a $56,000 submittal. Um, because the grant um, only can be, just like the other funds, be spent through December 31st. And so um, we're looking at four months of things to try to keep um, uh, aid in some of these things. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the, the, the grant in a nutshell in kind of our program, I'd be happy to take any questions from um, uh, school board or administration. Any questions? Nick? Um, I, I guess my, my question really is about, um, and I'd heard a little bit about this just through the community, and um, the biggest concern as a school member I have is that this is more than just child care. It would need to be a place where students have the ability, the technological ability and the space ability to, to learn and be engaged in their classroom through their, through their online portion of their hybrid schedule. So I guess I'd just like to know, and you don't have to go into great detail, but what, what, um, what, what's put in place to make sure that students, while they're in this facility, could continue their learning and it wouldn't just be like a strict child care facility? Sure. I mean, and our, our number one play, uh, goal is one was child care. And then now that we're learning what the school schedule looks like, it just came out when some of the grades are starting to have classes and when those joint uh, sessions are. And so our plan is as we learn those, it's our understanding that every child is going to have a device and headphones. Um, and we're going to act more like the parents. Um, just like if you're at home at child care with a grandparent, we're going to put you in a space, help you get online, make sure you're connected to wherever you need to be. Um, we'll be able to uh, assist at the best of our ability, but at no time are we going to act as teachers um, or expected to be operated at that educational level. Um, we're looking at this as a, we're going to put kids in the right place at the right time, try to break up our groups once we know who's coming, when their classes are, can we, you know, have some space to design where if there's, you know, six kids from teacher A, we can pull them out and have the same lesson be, you know, have some sort of component piece where they're working together on it. Um, but again, 
I, I think we're trying to do uh, the right thing, uh, put kids in the right opportunities, and then be able to communicate back with parents at the end of the day, just like we would if they were in home club in aftercare, um, and say, you know, you know, Johnny tried to do this, he had trouble, you know, you know, and and, and kind of connect those two dots. Um, you know, I, I didn't mention at the beginning, and I probably should have, is that we are still going to continue to offer our before and after care program in the three uh, elementary schools in Wentworth. We are not doing it in the middle school because the numbers weren't enough to, um, to warrant that this time, but it's something we would consider later on if school went back to a different model. Um, but so hopefully that answers your question regarding the school piece. Um, I did have discussions with Sandy and Diane and, and, and other folks around, you know, if we were fortunate enough to hire an ed tech or have some sort of liaison back and forth between the school. Um, those are all gravies at the end of the day. Uh, just like you, we're trying to get this up and running safely, get parents back to work and provide an opportunity um, where kids can still um, be in a safe place um, and, and uh, have connection to the school. We've been working with Don in the IT department uh, about trying to make sure we have enough fiber and bandwidth in the building to have 40 kids on laptops at once streaming. Um, so uh, we're running through those same exercises right now. And once we get more um, definitive answers from the school on those scheduling and timing, we can finalize plans based on enrollment. Thank you. Sure. Sarah? Sarah? Thanks, Leanne. Um, Todd, you had mentioned, I think, that um, you guys are planning for about 40 would the funds, if we receive them, you said it was supplementary, but would that help in any way to scale it? Or is it irrelevant to scaling in terms of opening it up to other people, whether or not you get those funds? Sure. So the reason why we're doing the grant the way it, it is, is that if we don't receive it, it's it's not. Our, 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 our model is based on putting 40 kids in a day in the building. Um, and... Uh, being able to provide the, the program that we want to provide. Um, presently, I think that we might be able to get some more kids in there, Sarah. Um, but I want to be able to say that confidently down the road. And if a month from now, when we're up and running, hopefully, that we can say, you know what, we can take another 10 kids comfortably based on space and function and, and the rules at that time. The last thing we wanted to do is overcommit a model and then not be able to deliver it. So um, at some point, we would love to be able to come back and say, you know, we have room for another 10 kids. Do we want to open up the general public? Do we want to reach out to school? Do we want to reach out needs-based students? Um, our initial model was trying to serve the group we had in front of us that we knew needed it. Um, we just surveyed the parents on Friday, get responses back. And so we know we have the folks. Um, now, granted, just like um, someone mentioned previously about enrollment, those things change. Someone's mind may change in two weeks. We may have more demand. And so at that point, we'll need to figure out how we add and move people in and out of this program uh, once we establish and finalize what it truly is going to look like. Okay, thanks, Todd. And, and you may have more slides, so you can table this if you're going to get to it. But so you said you had roughly 210 registered for child care, 72 people that were interested, but if you only have room for 40, I guess, what's the process that you're going to use to select? Yep. So I'm sorry, I should clarify a little bit. What we, 40 in each cohort day. So right now we have Monday, Tuesday, 39 students committed. And on Thursday, Friday, we have 43 committed. And so 40 was our target on cohort days. Gotcha. So it sounds like based on the interest, you could technically accommodate everyone that's shown interest so far. Right now. And again, yeah. like I said, 43, okay. cool. hopefully we can figure out Again, when once we close um, and, and finalize, well, one get permission and finalize our lease, um, you know, then we can look back and and really get in there, measure space. We're going off a of rough blueprints, like okay, here's where I can fit ten by the, you know, getting enough space. Uh, how are they going to eat? How you know those type of things, um, and be able to go from there. I mean, the thing about this with this grant funding, this is a 12 month commitment for us regardless of the state that the schools and whatever model hybrid red or green and so um, it's a huge huge thing that the town is trying to do to try to help uh, parent groups and hopefully we can become better and serve more that's the ultimate goal through here but um, if we were to stay there for the whole year it's about a four hundred and thirty thousand dollar program between the lease operating expenses staffing um, 
So it's a big undertaking for us um, to try to get this far. So proud of everybody's commitment. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? If I could just chime in, I, I just appreciate, Todd, uh, first of all, that you are doing most of the work with this grant. You've been on the phone with the State Department quite a bit to try to understand the good questions that you've been asking. Uh, as a school system, I personally see the need. Uh, being a parent myself, when my wife and I worked, it is a stressor, and I know that probably is the case for many families. Um, Todd and I have talked that if we have any equipment that's not being used, particularly like chairs or tables in storage, we would work with our facilities director and try to accommodate that need. And again, I, I appreciate the work that you've done, Todd, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, you will receive some money from the state, even though we're only at 4.7% on the, uh, the numbers. But I, I, I'm optimistic, and, and good luck with it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate everybody's help and willingness to help. I know we've, we've pulled some meetings together late. Uh, Todd Jepson's been great. We've been looking at equipment and pulling stuff out of every corner of possible to try to make this as affordable and as operable as, every, as, as can be. So sure. I appreciate that, everybody's willingness. Um, Todd, before you uh, go, I know that in watching both the workshop and the public hearing last night with town council, they are asking for some sort of a letter of endorsement from the board um, that we are willing to, you know, we're in support of this program to Sandy's point that if we had um, spare tables, chairs, desks that we would be able to assist you, um, we will be working on something in order to Wonderful. get that to you so that they will have this before they go to vote next week. I, I appreciate that very much. And like I've said to, in private conversation, we, we feel supported. Um, we understand everybody is, um, you know, drinking through a fire hose, if you will, right now, trying to get everything up and going and running and do it safely. So um, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. All right. Leanne, I have some questions. I don't know. I don't think you can see me. Oh, I'm so sorry, Hillary. Your hand hadn't gone up, so... Sorry. Are yes. you looking for the blue hand or are we doing yes, actual hands? I was looking for the blue <laughs> hand because I oh, can't see I didn't everybody think we were on the screen. That. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'll do the blue hand next time. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Ho. Um, so you, you sort of answered my question that, that even though the money can only be used through December, you're planning on um, committing for the full 12 months. So uh, I have a couple questions. One is... Um, what you're only asking for fifty six thousand dollars, but it sounds like it's going to be almost a half a million dollars to run for the year. So, like, what is the rest going to be made up by parents? By, yeah, but it'll pay, be fees. paying for it. Yeah, there is okay. a fee, there'll be a daily fee for for the eleven hours of care potential. Uh, okay. Presently, the model is fifty dollars a day um, for the eleven hours, um, and so if we stayed in a full hybrid model for the full school school year we could cover the cost. And so that's why anything we can do to reduce our initial budget in case we go green, we'll be working in the background once and if we get this going to be modeling red uh, as childcare centers have been open throughout this whole uh, pandemic. And then also if it goes green, there'll be some folks as, you know, to use Sandy's chart as an example, people are still over the board um, with how they feel, where they are timing and what they know. And so we'll be looking at other opportunities um, but we do uh, have, it's, it's a 12 month commitment, commitment right now. Okay, and then my other question is, um, how, if, the, if this all goes through, you said it was like a two day turnaround for the, um, for the grant mm -hmm. um, and that you have a, a potential uh, um, agreement with the House of Lights. Yep. But I assume that once you get in there, you're gonna need to make some changes yep. I mean, because it was a light store and now it's going to be a child care. So yep. what's your like turnaround time in terms of when the first day that you'll be able to accept children is? Sure. Our, what we surveyed the parents for was uh, first Monday in, in October. Um, you know, if I could wave the magic wand and have it the last week in September, that would be great. Um, my staff and other department staff are doing a lot of work in the background, uh, trying to lay plans and get things in line, even though, um, you know, we still haven't gotten approval yet, but we're doing the work to try to do all the, the, the groundbreaking work. Um, so if we do get approval next week, we can go full bore ahead. Um, 
Luckily, the House of Lights went under a renovation seven years ago, so it's in fantastic shape. Um, you know, we've got some, it's funny, when you take out a thousand lights, it's dark in there. So we have to have some lights installed. Um, Does it have that giant chandelier still? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be a beacon of hope. Um, but so um, there's, there's some electrical work to do and that sort of stuff. Um, we're looking at this as a total flexible model. We've been uh, talking with different companies that uh, uh, Jeff can put me on to, but petitions and movable things. We don't want to screw a thing down if we don't have to, because after a month, if we want to change and flex, we want to be able to grab it, turn it, flip it. Um, and in 12 months, if we're if we're deciding that we're not going to be there anymore and it's not the case, and we can pick all that stuff up and and um, and have it for use in another area. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of work, um, but I feel comfortable that based on the condition of that building, we'll be ready to go uh, at least by that first Monday in October. Okay, thank you. I, I just have one more question. I was just wondering, um, was there any consideration to offering this to town employees? like teachers, firefighter, police, that kind of thing? Yeah, so we were asked We were asked that after we started working down this process and just recently um, by some other members of the board. Um, and we, our goal was at first to serve the parents that are, had, had existing childcare requests to us. We felt like we had an obligation to them. Um, and, I, and I've replied to this answer numerous times over the last couple of days in question of, is if we can expand our footprint, then we'll consider all those options once we know where we, we need to be um, and reach back out to town leadership and school leadership to see how we fill some of those gaps. But um, our first goal was always to try to service the parents of, that are already pre-registered for child care um, to make sure we, we serve them because they needed the, they had the need prior um, to this. So. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, April. Leanne, you had mentioned uh, sending a letter of support for their application packet. Um, it's my feeling right now that the board is in support of that. Is that something that we need to have a motion to vote um, more formally that, that yes, it does have the endorsement of the full board? For procedural, yes. That was a good catch we probably should um just to make sure that we okay. have dotted every i thank you sure so i would like to make a motion that the scarborough board of education compose a letter in support of community services pursuing grant money uh, to create a uh, daycare program okay so moved second all right do we need any further discussion? Ready for it. Mrs. Jurgen. Oh. All right, I don't know where my blue hand is. I Hillary. It. Um, I just, I, I, I certainly support this and I appreciate all the work um, that seems to have gone into this. Um, I just, I do wish that we had thought about um, offering this to our town employees, um, our teachers and, and other town employees first. Um, but it, it's, I, I hope that we'll be able to do that. Um, but I do, you know, thank everybody for all the hard work that they've been doing. Obviously you guys have put a lot of time into this in a crunched time, in a time crunch. Are we back to voting? I believe we are. Ms. Durgan. Was, was uh, I thought yes? you saw my hand. I thought that's what you were <laughs> calling on me. Oh, so yes. we're, we're voting now. We're voting. <laughs> okay, sorry. I don't, yes. Ms. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. And it passes. All right. I appreciate that, everybody. Thank you, and good luck with all the decisions and work you have to do in front of you. So, have a great evening. Thanks, Todd. Thank, Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Yeah. Bye, guys. Okay. Moving into six point three, it is a CRF update. Kate, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, hello. 
I'm Kate Bolton. I'm the business manager for the Scarborough Public Schools. And uh, I did drop a few slides into the presentation this evening because my brain has turned off. And uh, so the slides are a little wordier than I like, but I'm hoping that they will allow me to remember all the things that I'd like to tell you and also have a record of those later on. Um, there has been a lot of interest, um, and rightfully so, in the fact that the state has very kindly allocated $2 million in coronavirus relief funds to the Scarborough Public Schools. Uh, the relief funds are called CRF, that's what we're labeling it, coronavirus relief funds. And it is a grant that came from the federal government through the CARES Act. Uh, a, a bunch of money was sent to the state of Maine for various reasons, and the state has been over the past year sort of figuring out where all those bits and pieces go. And, and Todd Souza just spoke to the small piece that they've uh, split off for daycare. This is the biggest piece that has come out to schools. And um, the allocations were made uh, based on school enrollment and, and student population rather than based on the usual EPS formula, which is why Scarborough is looking at receiving $2 million and not uh, you know, 500,000 or 100,000 like we got from the ESSER funds um, because of our economic status. Um, if you could flip that back for just a sec, sure. Diane, I'm sorry. Uh, I did wanna mention that the, the funds come with some caveats they are uh, specifically for opening school under pandemic conditions. Because of that, they are earmarked for costs that are not in our budget, that were directly caused by the COVID-19 emergency, and that we have no other funds for. Um, it, the last thing on this list is they can't be applied toward reimbursement for lost revenue, and they can't supplant previously budgeted expenses. Um, there's also a very short time frame on this and that'll, that'll come up in the next slide. So this is the application process. We got our application in, uh, I must confess we did get it in on August 31st. <laughs> we were not early, but we were also not late. Uh, and our application has already been approved, which is very nice. Um, the funds must be committed by September 30. And what that means is that our budget that we've submitted to the state is basically locked down as of September 30. And the things that we've said we were going to purchase, um, they've told us that there's a 10% uh, transfer option, let's say. So if you asked for $100,000 in transportation, but you actually only spent $90,000 in transportation, you really needed that $10,000 in another category that they would allow that type of transfer. Um, you don't get to overspend, overspend the funds themselves, but there's a small amount of flexibility in how you spend them. Uh, they would like us to lock down our request by September 30, which is actually kind of cool because we've put in what we think we need, but we haven't started school yet. So we have a pretty good idea of what we're gonna spend it on and I'll go through that in a minute. Um, but if something goes in a different direction and we need funds for a different reason, we have until September 30 to make an adjustment to our application. Now here's the tricky piece. The money has to be expended and the items or services purchased must be in use by December 30. So when we first heard about this money coming, we thought, well, this is actually really cool. Maybe we can hire some extra teachers or we can hire some staff for the year or we can enter into a contract for the year with uh, you know, a software provider or a service organization that might help us with cleaning or sanitation. Because of the limited time frame, we are not allowed to spend a penny for anything that occurs after December 30. Any service provided, any hours worked, um, which means that we have to be really careful about how we allocate the funds. So we've we really focused on upfront expenses, equipment wherever possible, um, materials wherever possible. Um, and we know that when January 1st rolls around, we may have some of these same expenditures, but those are gonna have to be supported in our regular budget. And luckily we do have a little bit of what we've been calling COVID money 
in our uh, operating budget as well. Um, I mentioned here that the, the application is in, it's been approved, we're really excited about that. And uh, we, need, we now need to build our financial structures in Munis because the tracking is pretty arduous and um, the documentation requirements being federal money, uh, pretty specific, pretty detailed uh, documentation has to be kept and submitted to the state. This is a pretty small and super wordy slide. Uh, <laughs> but this is taken out of uh, some information that we published to the Scarborough community, to our parents and, and families and staff uh, recently in a, in a letter that, that Sandy put out last week. And there's seven categories. Um, and we were able to find types of expenses that we thought would be helpful to supplement what was available in our own budget in each of those categories. Transportation, uh, we're looking into getting uh, used passenger vans, lightly used low mileage vans have been really good to us. And uh, public, uh, public services is, is doing a search for uh, the actual vehicles for us and, and they've been coming up with some pretty good ideas of where they can find vans that we can use. That gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of um, transporting kids in a smaller vehicle, fewer children, more space, and drivers who do not have to have a CDL. They would have to, of course, have training, uh, but they wouldn't have to have a, a bus driver's license. So that gives us some flexibility. In facilities modifications, we focused on uh, expanding the health clinic spaces. I think somebody earlier spoke to the fact that we're, we have a room for a well clinic and a room for a potential infection clinic. Um, so we've been building those. Uh, we've had some consultants work on our HVAC system um, to make sure that we've got everything in place uh, for safety and air quality control. Um, and we're working on some outdoor break areas with some tents. Materials and supplies are all the bits and pieces that we need to uh, protect ourselves, protect our students, store belongings, um, keep things safe and, and clean, um, sanitizing equipment. Uh, we've got some pretty, pretty sophisticated materials out there. Um, nutrition services has its own category. And I think uh, we heard some t uh, talk about that when we did the, uh, the opening presentation at the last meeting, that uh, they've got a system now for remote ordering, touchless payment, they're packaging everything as single serving, and they're actually using carts and, and uh, heated carts and cooled carts to be able to transport food. And uh, a lot of that material will come to us through this grant. Additional staff hours is a biggie. Um, we have put in for money for training and uh, staff work to plan and create new systems and protocols. Again, this has to be a supplement to our regular budget, so it's not the normal things that we do, but over and above that. Um, paying supplemental subs to come in to help us with our staffing resources, um, and uh, extra staff perhaps on transportation and facilities. We're still trying to hire some, so if anybody is looking for a little work, uh, it's a great opportunity to join the Scarborough School Department. Professional development, again, builds on that additional staff hours, but it's specific to uh, paying staff to attend extra trainings and develop um, their own protocols and their own safety plans and curriculum resources. And in technology, we're spending a good chunk of money on equipment. Um, we're doing the live streaming cameras and the support devices for that through this grant. We already have the devices um, that we need for the most part, but we have some extra devices that we're purchasing through this grant. Again, supplementing what we already have for our staff and students. And uh, remote services and software. Again, this is just short term, so this is just the things that we would be using through December 30, but we're getting a little boost in that area as well. And I think that's the end of the really small types long story. Um, so if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them.
I actually have a question that I'm afraid to ask. Um, I'm afraid to answer it. <laughs> Given the reporting and the information that needs to go back to the state, is there any concern that the state could come back and say, ha, ah, just kidding, you really can't expend on these items? Um, it's, a, it's a fair question. Um, there are strict rules about what you can and can't spend. The good news is that the Department of Education really wants us to succeed with this. They really want to be super supportive of the school districts. And I have been in, I would say, about 10 webinars with the finance group and some of the other managers at the Department of Education talking about what you can spend, what you can't spend, how to code it, how to back it up, how to give the right documentation that's going to make um, them happy. And, and then, of course, they're answering to the federal government as well. It's, uh, this money comes from the Department of the Treasury, which is a little weird for us. We usually get our uh, federal monies through US Ed, the Education Department. So even the folks at uh, Maine DOE are still kind of learning, well, you know, do we have to do anything differently? But there, are, there have been rules around federal grants for years, and uh, most of us are pretty good at navigating them in a small way. We learned a lot from the ARA funds back in 2009, 2010. We learned a lot of things we weren't doing well. Mm -hmm. And I'd say the state is really on top of it and wants to support us with those things. Okay, thank you. Hillary, you just need to come off mute. Um, I apologize in advance if I missed this, Kate, but have, ha, like, you said we had $2 million. Like, how much of all of these things that you've talked about is accounted for in that two million? How much of the $2 million is accounted for, I guess, is what I'm saying. Like, how much of, of that have you budgeted? All of the $2 million is budgeted in these categories. So we had to okay. submit a grant application that used up the money. And again, that's very similar. Oh, okay. That's very similar to what we do, for example, with Title I, although Title I is $150,000. We have to tell them specifically what the projects are that we're gonna spend that money on and then get the approval for that in advance before we start submitting our uh, reimbursement requests. So this okay, is, this is for... the two million here. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. I actually, I have a spreadsheet of the budget with the, with the dollars attached and I can share that with you guys or share that with finance committee. Okay. So you'll know what's what. Thank you. Alicia? Thank you. Where, where does this money put us in terms of meeting our COVID needs? It sure helps. Um, it's really helped with a lot of the material stuff. Just, you know, tons of uh, PPE. The, the state is giving us uh, personal protective equipment, but we certainly need a lot more than what they're giving us. Um, a lot of the cleaning equipment, you know, a lot of the things that we've already done that we were going to try to figure out how to pay for out of our budget. Um, the biggest piece for me that I don't really know the answer to yet is, is the staffing, because as we're trying to hire up extra subs and extra folks to join us, um, we're, uh, we're not exactly sure how much extra money we're gonna need to spend because that's still a little bit of a moving target. Um, I would love it if we had another two million for the second half of the year. I don't think that's gonna happen. So that's why we're kind of front loading the purchases of, of equipment that will last us all year long and, and far beyond one year. So I'm not, I'm not sure I'm really answering your question, but I think, I think it's really um, super helpful. And I don't think that we're having, I haven't come across anything where we said, wow, we really need to do this, but we can't afford to. Any other questions? Kate, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Kate. That's great. Okay. All right. 6.4 is an update on the school reopening plan. Diane? Sure. So, um, you know, I want to start by saying the work that's being done in our district right now by all of our staff is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there's one segment of our organization where people aren't working tirelessly. Um, and so it's, it's really been incredible um, for many of us who have, who have been working for the past uh, several months um, on this reopening. And, and even, um, you know, for those who are just returning, there is absolutely um, no shortage of efforts being made. So um, 
I wanted to provide you an update um, in regards to some pieces. Um, but before we do that, I also wanted to share a great example of the creative work that's happening in our schools. Um, and so um, Scarborough High School put together a safety video to share with families and students. I believe it was shared today. We might have an actor in the room. Um, <laughs> we do. <laughs> and so um, I think it gives a good example of what some of the practices look like. So I thought that would be a great way for us to go ahead and get started. Okay. I'm Mr. Terrio, Assistant Principal for Sophomores and Seniors. And I'm Mr. Brown, Assistant Principal for Freshmen and Juniors. And I'm Mr. Legage, Director of Athletics and Student Activities. And I'm Ms. Ketch, Principal of Scarborough High School. Welcome to Scarborough High School this fall. What follows is a short video that will help you learn what you need to do to be safe and healthy and what our plan is for the fall. Good luck. Please put your mask on. Thank you very much. Grab some sanitizer and have a good day. Good morning, girls. Make sure you stay three feet apart. Grab some hand sanitizer and have a good day.
seeing that it's almost dismissal time, how we leave school is gonna look differently this year. Instead of everyone leaving all at once, we're gonna do staggered dismissal by hallway. Good afternoon, Scarborough High School. We're ready to dismiss group three, the A200 and G200 quarters. You may leave at this time. Have a great afternoon. We should go change for cross country. Oh, good idea. I'll go check. Hopefully, practice now. Yeah. Oh, we should just go up wait in Plumber Gym. Oh, that's a good idea. Hey, we gotta hustle to practice. We gotta get to the checkpoint and our coach, though. Some people at home were having a hard time hearing the sound on that, and so I apologize for that. I know that we're still um, working on this new system to make sure that everything is working in the way that it should. Um, so, Diane, I checked on YouTube too, and I couldn't hear it on there as well, but I'm just wondering if maybe we can post it because it, it looks like a cool video. Oh yeah, we will um, definitely post it. I believe that it. it got sent out to all of the high school families this afternoon. Um, and again, I'd love to say Thank that um, I'm an expert here, but that is not the case. All right, so let's see if I can get back to our screen sharing. So if you want to like make conversation while I'm doing this, yeah. that would be fabulous. Sure. <laughs> Just like I say, it's nice to see visually what it looks like. You know, yes. you read about this stuff and how it's supposed to be done and it's very concrete when you can see it in the uh, Tape like this. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. Seeing the cafeteria the way that it was set up for the high school was really cool that they can sit at least two to a table. There's some conversation. Is that going to be the case with all schools that they're going to be able to be face to face it? It might look much? differently according to the setup of each school. Uh, it's a fair question though that, you know, I don't. Kate? Thank you. I'm Mr. Terrio, assistant principal for sophomores and seniors. And I'm Mr. Brown, assistant principal. We're not really good at watching that. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for that. Okay, so I think we are back. All right, we are working through our technology. Filming the video was actually really fun. We did it, I think, last week, and there were a lot of us there. It was really fun. We all wore masks, and sitting in that classroom actually felt really normal, which I was really surprised by. It was like really good to be in the building, be around some people, so that just made me more excited to go back. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And I was very excited about the sports side of it, so just put that out. Exactly. And you're going to hear more about all of that in a few minutes as well. It gave me physical pain to see those desks on the stage, though. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> yeah. I can appreciate that, Max. So um, we also wanted to just share some other visuals. I know that we did that at, at our last meeting to give you a glimpse at what some of our classrooms would look like. And so 
we wanted to share some of that progress with you. And so um, if you take a look at this slide, you'll see that um, the front facing plexiglass, this is fresh installed today. Um, again, I know that uh, we have all experienced a lot of patience as well as frustration in terms of um, needing to know that um, the entire universe is in need of the same things that we are. And so um, we definitely have been working within time constraints. Um, but those front-facing plexiglass pieces um, were installed in four out of our six schools today. And Rosbera is going to be finishing those up for us tomorrow. Um, these are some other examples of we've got um, you know, markings on the floors in the school with six foot distancing. Um, and we've got arrows in the hallways indicating uh, which way travel should go. If we take a look at the next slide, a couple more examples. Um, we had some students from Wentworth who sewed some masks and came in to donate those today. Um, and then we had a, a Wentworth parent who did a, a school supply drive at her uh, place of work. Um, that's Tamika Donahue. And, and she came and um, made that donation to Mrs. Crasby. And so, you know, everyone is really pitching in, um, and it really is a full out community effort. I also wanted to update you this evening in regards to the progress that we have made in terms of the health and safety pieces of our protocol specifically. Um, and I think as we heard earlier this evening, um, not all of these pieces were in place when our teachers came last week. Um, and, and that certainly um, wasn't because uh, folks took the summer off and, and, and decided to wait um, for people to come back to get started. But we really were up against um, literally waiting for, for much of this um, to come in. And, and I know, you know, Kate has been working extremely hard and, and her friends in the business office um, in tracking these requisitions and calling vendors and getting updates on things. Um, but at this point, I, I am really proud to say that as we look at um, the pieces of the state framework in section one under health and safety, um, we have, uh, a, as of today, uh, we are just about there. As I said, with our front facing plexiglass in our offices, those last two installs are happening tomorrow. And that again was because um, uh, the contractor was waiting for the product to be delivered. Um, we are, uh, we have just received our tents and um, Todd and his staff will be putting those tents up um, next week. And so, you know, that is uh, another outstanding piece. But I am, you know, happy to report that um, due to, again, lots of hands uh, in our district, all of our staff have received PPE. Our nurses um, have also. Uh, if you go down into the maintenance garage, there is literally a treasure trove of PPE there. We have received numerous pallets of PPE from the state, in addition to the things that we had ordered locally. Um, and so uh, those things have been received. Um, and um, so those pieces are in place. Um, I know that, um, again, Todd and his staff have been working tirelessly. We had a moving company assist us last weekend to move desks from Wentworth School to the K-2 schools uh, because it made more sense to uh, utilize those at the K-2 schools rather than put them in storage um, and come up with a different solution for K-2. to So that was a great creative solution. And so um, we had a moving company help us with that. And in addition, um, you've probably noticed some Rigby storage bins um, on some of our sites and those are housing excess furniture and tables that 
we are currently um, unable to use because of our need to meet the requirements. Um, Todd and his staff is uh, completing the moves of that excess furniture at the high school, um, and, and that will be complete by the end of the week as well in my checking with him, and, and I know that he's on this call, so certainly if you have other questions, um, he could help to answer those um, as well. Um, other pieces in terms of, um, you know, so that's our state framework. We've also, again, taken a look at our school reopening plan that, that you had approved on July 30th in regards to where we're at with the key health recommendations that were made as well as um, making sure that we have hit the um, main pieces under the facilities need within that plan. Um, and as we, as we take a look at that, when we look at the key health recommendations that were made by the START team, the one outstanding piece out of 17 items um, was the um, making of COVID kits uh, for families with thermometers. And again, that is a great recommendation from our START team. Um, but in terms of um, uh, being able to obtain uh, that number of thermometers or those types of materials, uh, they had also made a recommendation about having a magnet or a laminated card with these um, questions on there. But, you know, that is a piece that, um, that our team, um, you know, did not not have the resources to be able to do. Um, although these are posted on every single door, they have been uh, front-facing door. Um, they have been widely disseminated to our families and to our staff. Um, and those are pieces that, as we talked about in the plan, we'll continue to push those things out. Um, so those are those pieces. I wanted to also share with you, um, here's some other great examples um, as we think about what are we doing all of this for. I had the opportunity um, earlier um, this week to, to visit some of our K-2 schools and they did meet and greets um, with their students. And it was just really lovely. Um, there was so much excitement on the part of our students and our families. Um, and the teachers did such an amazing job. Um, if you take a look at this top photo, they had spread themselves out. This is at Pleasant Hill. And they had spread themselves out on the front lawn and the teachers had posters with their names, and, and um, you know, each family would go one at a time to, to have that little meet and greet. Um, this lower right photo shows an example of some of our teachers with front-facing classrooms had decorated their windows, um, and it said peak care so that the, the children could look in to see what their classroom was going to be like. Um, because it wasn't an open house wherein, you know, everyone came inside. So um, lots of smiles, lots of excitement. Um, a as I was there experiencing that, it just reminded me of the positive energy um, that we all get from students and why we do this work. Um, and it was great uh, to be able to be part of that. Um, I also wanted to share with you this evening, I know that um, at our last meeting there were some questions about uh, what, what is the school's response going to be in the case of a positive COVID case. And we actually, again, um, as, as we have said throughout this pandemic, we continue to be fluid in our response because the information that we get changes on a very regular basis. And so for example, um, this is the standard operating protocol that we got from the DOE and the CDC last, uh, just a week ago Wednesday, um, out detailing um, what we can expect from the CDC and the state if there were to be a positive case in the school. And so I thought that um, out of the entire document, this one table really speaks to um, what that looks like. And I thought that would be an important slide uh, to have in this public slide deck so that folks can see um, 
how the CDC and the DOE is um, recommending um, how they're going to react um, in, in these cases. So whether or not you have a single case in a single classroom or uh, one or two students in a few classrooms or um, three or more students within a school and what we can expect to have happen. Um, I know there were also some questions recently about um, our families wanting to know, are we gonna be notified about a case? And again, um, we rely on the DOE and the CDC to direct us in that. And so in this recent document that we received, um, they shared that um, if there is a, a student or a staff member, um, any, anyone in the school that would test positive, that um, we would be sending a letter informing the entire school community that there was a positive case. And then uh, for those folks who uh, the CDC would deem as close contacts, they would be receiving a different letter letting them know um, that they were close contacts. And then again, the CDC advising them about here are the next steps that have to happen. Um, so I think that's a really important piece because um, that is going to help us really um, react in a strategic and consistent way. Um, this isn't a school by school decision or there's no one staff member who bears the onus of the responsibility. This really is a matter of um, our school nurses talking with um, you know, that, that DOE representative and the CDC to get that guidance in terms of how we should be responding. So um, these are great pieces. And, and again, I know that um, if I think about our school nurses, for example, they have been working throughout the summer um, developing our plans and working with our district physician. And, you know, these are pieces that everybody has been really hungry for. Uh, receiving, um, and it's great to know that we have those. Um, yeah, so those are the, oh, there is one other piece that I wanted to share tonight that I don't have on the slides, and that is in relationship to some, again, um, very late breaking news that we've received in regards to our food service department. Um, and so, um, there was information that we received earlier this week. In fact, I was on a webinar yesterday and Peter Esposito, who's our food service director, was on that webinar today. Um, and so um, we have all um, schools in the state of Maine who are deemed um, feeding sites for the summer program have the ability to extend um, their feeding site status through December 30th. Um, and so what that really means is that um, instead of enrolling in the National School Lunch Program, which is what we would be doing at this time generally, because we have participated in the summer reading program in the past, but that um, you know generally ends at the end of the summer and then the National School Lunch Program picks up um, you know, and students who are eligible for free or reduced lunch um, are able to continue, um, you know, to, to have that happen in the fall and during the school time. Uh, with this um, new federal um, designation to extend the summer feeding program, what that really means for us is that um, our food program here is going to be at no cost um, for those for regular meals. Um, and so if we think about, you know, what that is by definition, um, you know, students, it is my understanding, will be able to access breakfast and lunch at no cost uh, without qualifying for that. And then um, the school will be um, seeking reimbursement for all of those meals in the same way that we do in the summer feeding program. And Kate, I don't know if there's anything more that you want to add to that because it's certainly not, um, you know, I'm not a
food service expert. No, and I can't really either. Um, yeah. I Right. Yeah, and the other reason for that um, is um, from a federal standpoint, there really is a lot more safety involved in not needing to be concerned about um, monetary transactions happening um, and that being handled or students doing point of service entries with their code numbers, um, you know, and again, our food service department, Peter had come up with some really creative plans even prior to getting this. Um, but to hear this news this week, uh, I think is wonderful because all of our students will be able to benefit from it. Um, I don't know if Todd Souza is still on this call or listening, um, but so basically it, it provides food for anyone under 18. And so for our students, um, on the days that they're not in school, they can also access um, food. So, you know, that's going to take a little bit of planning. Um, and um, in terms of how do we make sure that uh, food is available to those folks who need it. But our nutrition service department has been doing that throughout the summer. Um, and they've really been incredible with the work that they've done. So we're really excited that that is going to be able to continue. So that is what I have in terms of um, the, the pieces that I wanted to update you on. But again, we also have all of our principals with us. Um, you know, we have some administrators here in person and others who are on the Zoom call. So if there are other questions that are coming up for folks, um, we certainly want to take an opportunity to provide information. Um, I know you had mentioned about the contractor coming in. Yeah. Will that include finishing the um, nurses station that we heard during public comments? So I believe that the the nurses station, and again, if you if you could bring Todd on, he could certainly sure. speak to that more directly. Todd, I have uh, brought you over. You just need to unmute, please. Hi there, can you hear me all right? Sure can. Yeah, the high school uh, clinic, we <clears throat> extended the clinic by uh, joining the bathroom, actually. So the well clinic and the um, sick clinic, I guess is what it's called, uh, can both have access to a bathroom with privacy locks, obviously. Um, and the the construction that was referenced was just making a doorway. Um, there was no construction going on today. It was just moving furniture in and helping the nurses coordinate what they wanted where in that new space. Um, so that's done. Um, we'll have to do a final clean tomorrow just uh, for, you know, any dust and debris that takes place when you're moving stuff around but in general the space is ready to be used and uh, operational so there was no construction going on today other than just moving um, some furnishings that the nurses wanted um, to have in there so uh, it worked it worked pretty well uh, aside from fire alarm <laughs> from the sheetrock dust but uh, in general uh, I spoke with Lisa Verzoni today in the clinic and um, got her the remaining things she's looking for, and uh, it seems all good to me. Um, and I didn't get any overwhelming concern or complaint from either of the nurses at the high school clinic today. So, and the other schools also have had modifications made. We didn't have any construction per se. They've just had additional spaces. They have portable hand wash sinks where we couldn't access um, either water or, or a drain or in some cases both. Um, the middle school has a, a complete room 
uh, with a sink that we were able to install over the summer. And um, the same goes for the three K two schools where they've really been creative about how they're going to reutilize space um, in, in really compact areas already. So um, they've been hugely accommodating and accepting of, you know, what's not an ideal situation and they're, and they're making the best of it. And I, I can't say enough about how uh, accommodating and, and uh, open to, to change they've been. It's, it's, it's been great. So we've been working a lot of hours to make it happen, but um, we're, we're getting, we're getting there and feels, feels pretty good to me. Okay. Thank you. Sarah. Hey, Fran. Um, so Dan, I thank you for giving that update. I think, where my head is at right now is, you know, we've, we've heard a lot over the last couple of days through email and then obviously in the public comment um, from teachers who have um, a variety of concerns, but some of them are around safety. I just want to like, focus on, on those for a minute. And I guess based on your presentation, it was a little hard to follow where we are based on where we said we would be. Um, and so I don't know, like, if there's, as we had talked about, like, maybe producing some sort of checklist and, and mm -hmm. so we can see, like, this has been done or this hasn't been done and when it will be done because, you know, we still have tomorrow, we still have the weekend, not, not assuming that people are going to work over the weekend, but there still is more time. Um, so then I would also, though, extend that out to the other factors in the reopening plan. So you, you did really just, and I, you may have more slides, um, I do. just focus on the health and safety. Okay, but there are other components that I would, yes. and I would like to know sort of where we are with those other components that were in the school reopening plan um, so that we can sort of as a board try and understand where we are versus where we said we were going to be and then weigh that with some of the feedback that we've been hearing from teachers as well. Sure, and, and again, I apologize if I wasn't clear um, in providing my explanation about um, the checklist or how I went about doing this. And so, um, you know, what I did was um, I went right to the state website to look at the framework for health and safety. And I literally had a conversation with each one of our principals and went through each of the things item by item. Um, and, and again, um, the pieces that I talked to you about, about the front facing plexiglass um, and the tents being put up were the outstanding items on that list. Um, we did have some items that were in motion today um, in terms of um, in some of our buildings, they were still putting down um, some of the floor arrows and stickers, um, but, but I believe that um, I got confirmation from our principals that those things happened. So um, I apologize if I wasn't clear in helping you to know how I had gone through that process. I do have Don, um, uh, I have more slides for the school reopening and Don was gonna talk more about technology and I know Monique has some pieces to talk about the educational plan. So I just wanted to, you know, kind of assess where we are with this segment before we jump along too far. Hillary? Oh, Sarah, were you all set? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll wait and see the other sections before I ask my other questions, but thank you, Diane. Sure. Hillary? Um, so I, I agree with, with Sarah. Um, thank you, Diane, for going through and doing all of that work. Um, I think it would be really helpful to see that visually um, to make sure uh, that, you know, like I said, you know, some teachers may have come in earlier in the week and things weren't done um, that are now done. And mm -hmm. just to give those people some peace of mind, um, this is checked off. And frankly, parents, you know, some of us are remote, but some of us are sending our kids to school. And I just think that it would create a lot of confidence if we were able to say, here's the list of all of the requirements um, that we have met and they're all done. Um, and I know, I think what you're saying is that you, you are saying that. I just think it would be really helpful 
um, to have a visual. Sure. So, so I guess my question is, are there things that are on that DOE checklist that aren't done yet? Besides, the, so are you saying only the front facing plexiglass and the Right. So, so like I can, I can go through and be more specific if you would rather me do that. So there are um, several key areas. The first is symptom screening before coming to school um, that students and staff members know the protocol for self check for symptoms um, and that any uh, that they know that um, they need to report those symptoms and not be present at school and that there are directions for that. So that's the first section. The, sec the second section that is necessary under the state requirement is um, the use of masks and face coverings. Um, again, that adults are required to wear masks and face coverings. Um, our nurses certainly have done that with our staff. Um, that students are required to wear face coverings. And again, um, our nurses put together a great two-page document um, that we sent out, and I know I, I've noticed those um, up in our schools as well. Um, uh, there's another bullet here that uh, face coverings must be worn by all students on the bus. Um, I think I've been really clear with that in my communications to parents about transportation. Um, and then uh, the fourth bullet is around face shields being an alternative as um, for for those with medical needs um, and we've been communicating uh, that I know our nurses um, have been already talking with some of our families um, for whom students may need an accommodation and really working within that and um, making sure that that we can come up with some safe solutions the third category is personal protective equipment um, and making sure that um, school nurses have what they need um, or that other, um, you know, other folks um, who are uh, supporting students in a closer proximity um, than we might expect, um, that they also have access to that. And again, my understanding in checking with each of our building principals today um, is that um, that is th that we are there. Uh, the other piece under personal protective equipment is that um, that we have processes for when areas are closed off and how those need to be sanitized. Um, and I know that, that Todd and I have talked about that and my understanding is that um, he's working with his, um, his staff on that as well. Uh, the fourth category is around physical distancing and facilities. Um, and again, uh, included here is that uh, adults have knowledge that they are supposed to maintain six foot of distance um, to the highest extent possible and that um, as we consider uh, environments for our students, maintaining three foot distance is acceptable in and among students. Um, again, I'm quoting this right from the state um, requirements. So again, as we think about the spaces that our teachers have designed um, for their students, um, there definitely was some work that went into that this week, right? Because as a teacher and you're entering your classroom space and you might generally have had 24 desks and now we have smaller cohorts. And so, you know, again, it's not just like, how do I make this look so cutesy and um, inviting, but how do I make sure that it's safe? Um, how do I make sure that it's meeting the requirements? And our teachers have definitely expended a lot of effort um, in doing that. And again, I, I think our school administrators um, have been doing that in regards to the general spaces as well. Um, uh, the third bullet on here, uh, the second bullet, I'm sorry, I skipped that, is about um, six foot physical distancing um, during uh, lunch. And again, uh, I think we saw a great example there at the high school. Uh, and I know in visiting other schools that, that they're taking a look at that and our principals felt very confident um, in their plans for that. Uh, the third bullet is around a medical isolation room. Um, and we have that as Todd spoke and others have spoken early, 
or tonight um, we have our general clinic and then we have what our nurses are calling our respiratory clinic um, not our sick clinic <laughs> and um, you know and, and those spaces um, have been made available and, and as other people have said earlier um, it has required a lot of shifting and and some staff have um, you know had to move spaces that they were comfortable being in um, but this is a matter of public health and so we really want to make sure that we're doing that um, the fourth bullet under physical distancing and facilities is around ventilation um, I know that Todd spoke about that at our last um, board meeting um, in terms of uh, you know the audit that we had done and the uh, you know the work that's that's been done in that area and then the last bullet in physical distancing um, speaks to group sizes and making sure that we are not exceeding the governor's gathering size limits um, which again um, those are really clearly posted um, 50 students uh, in any one inside area together um, so our cafeterias, for example, our school gyms, um, and no more than 100 students, no more than 100 people gathering outside. Um, the fifth area is around hand hygiene, um, that um, folks receive training in proper hand hygiene. Um, we had a staff member come on earlier in regards to um, some videos that have been made available for them to watch. Um, during some of their professional development time um, and I know in talking with our nurses that they're also putting together some helpful resources to use with our students when they return uh, and then the other piece around hand hygiene is again um, uh, speaks to the procedures and protocols and so again the pieces that we've established for buses um, before and after eating um, after using the restroom which I would like to think that everybody has been doing um, not just during this pandemic that's my little public safety announcement um, and then um, you know before and after using um, a playground or shared equipment so um, that's the fifth area and then um, the sixth area is the return to school after illness um, and again as I said um, those are pieces wherein our, our nurses are going to be a critical piece in working with our families to be communicating that information. Okay, thank you. So it seems like the only thing that I see um, on the DOE recommendations that you haven't mentioned is there is a recommendation for staggering drop off times. Um, and I'm where are you at attention is um, if you are so the DOE guidelines they have um, a, a more specific um, health guidance document that you can access in each of those six um, those six bullet points mm -hmm. and one of those um, in terms of physical distancing and facilities the only recommendation like I said that I saw on there that you didn't mention was the um, recommendation to stagger drop off and pick up and I don't know if that means by time or just by dismissal I assume it could be easily done by dismissal but I'm just wondering um, what consideration has been given to that so in regards to that um, at each of our school sites our um, administrators have been working uh, to develop uh, changes in plans for drop off and pick up uh, we spoke at the last meeting in regards to the shifts that are being made with our buses um, and what that looks like so that um, there is a greater allowance of time um, you know for parents to be able to drop off I would also like to just add again um, in regards to transportation we are very appreciative of our parents um, being willing to transport their students um, that is really a critical piece of this plan um, that was uh, a part that uh, as we did the return to school survey and asked parents um, to select which plan they were most comfortable with we also needed um, some commitments from parents in regards to busing because again um, we 
are choosing not to have more than one student per seat on our buses. Hillary, you set? Your hand is still up. Um, I, I mean, I am, and I, I understand all of that from a transportation standpoint. And I think that it's all been amazing that you've been able to rework everything be, to, to accommodate the increased pickup and drop offs. I'm just, you know, like for example, and I can only use my, my own example here at the middle school, you know, it's like, okay, kids who ride the bus, you're dismissed. Okay. Walkers and pickups, you're all dismissed. I mean, that's everybody leaving the building at the same time. So, so I'm wondering, I'm wondering if, it, if those kind of accommodations have been made in terms of specific. Right. So I'm wondering if it would be helpful to hear from um, some of our building principals about what those practices and procedures look like. Because again, um, you know, the way that that might look at the middle school, as you've used as an example, Hillary, um, might be really different than the way that one of our smaller sites like Blue Point might do that. So. Um, I'm wondering, um, I know that our principals are out there, if, if that might be a, a piece that they might add more specificity for you. Yeah, I wasn't sure which was her, so I brought them both over. Okay, I think everyone. Oh, there's Anne. There we are. Okay, I think I have everybody promoted. May just need to unmute. I could speak, um, Hillary, to the middle school. So one of my um, sayings lately has been, let me un, has been, we're going to be going very slow. So when it come, we we call students for dismissal, and so we'll be calling smaller groups at a slower pace. Ann? Um, yeah, at, at eight corners, we're going to be dismissing bus students and pickups from different ends of the building, and we'll be taking kids directly to parents' cars um, as parents arrive. So, you know, it'll be a work in progress, obviously, and luckily with the um, half days next week with smaller, even smaller than our cohort groups, we'll be able to practice that and refine how we're doing that. But we are keeping kids, um, you know, separated and not just letting them all leave the building at once. So, but that's definitely something we've thought a lot about and, and worked on. At Wentworth, we're pretty well equipped just given our campus and the setup of our school and facility um, we're actually going to have four separate locations so the buses are going to use the access road third grade are going to go um, car riders will be in the former bus loop fourth grade car riders will be in the parent drop-off loop near the parking lot and fifth grade car riders will be using the service loop um, on the side of the building so it's literally four completely separate locations that we can then naturally stagger. So we certainly are going to ask for patience from our um, parents who are driving at first, but I feel really confident that we're going to get efficient at it and that some patterns will emerge with who arrives first and we can um, begin to get into a more predictable rhythm with that. But in terms of being able to um, safely distance our students, I feel confident about our ability to do that. Um, at Pleasant Hill and um, the other primary schools, we've actually purchased car tags, and so parents will receive two car tags for the family with their last name on them. So as they arrive, we have um, an approach um, that they use in baseball of who's on deck, and so we will um, project a Google slide in teacher's classrooms, and we'll put a group of students up on the screen um, who will be released first, and we'll continue through that process until all students are released. But like everyone else has said, it's a small group at a time, and we'll be allowing six um, cars in our bus loop at a time. Um, there'll be a lot of people on hand to support students getting um, into their vehicles. And realizing that you guys weren't able to hear the audio, Sue, I'm going to speak for you for one minute. 
um, the high school is going to be going um, floor by floor. Um, Sue, do you want to get the mic? Oh, oh, by hallway, sorry. Several hallways at a time will go, and then we'll do another section of the main floor, then we'll go upstairs and dismiss that in two groups as well. So they'll be doing staggers as well, Hillary? Yeah, we'll, we'll be staggering. Kelly Mullen Martin is on the call. She's the second Jessica Steele, I believe. Oh, it's okay. okay. <laughs> I just want to, honestly, Honestly, you guys, I just wanted to know that you had, Okay. I didn't need to know all the details. I just wanted to know right. that that had been taken care of. I guess I'm but just making the, the point that if a parent's listening and now they've heard from yeah. all the other five sites, we probably, for, <laughs> for consistency's sure. sake, should, should allow her to chirp in. I got a little confused by the two Jessica Steeles. So right. I didn't, even, <laughs> I didn't even realize I was another Jessica Steele. <laughs> 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 she shared the link with me by text, and so I guess we're twins. Um, so, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, everything that Jess and Ann said, uh, we're going to be doing at Blue Point. Uh, we shared a plan with parents um, tonight uh, that details all of the things that were said. We have talked about the possibility of, of doing um, – some kind of sign up genius or something like that. If we need to do some staggering and have people sign up for some times, if once we see what it looks like, there's a lot of things that are happening these days that we feel like we need to live it before um, we put some of those changes into place. So um, we feel like we have a good plan and we feel like we can be efficient, but certainly we're open to putting more in place if it doesn't work. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Felicia? As, as long as we have the principles on the line, I'd like to mm -hmm. know if there's equipment that has not, has not come in for your schools and if there are um, outstanding um, major items that are not done or not prepared. Um, Alicia, could you? I'm sorry, Alicia, I don't mean to interrupt. Can you turn your microphone mm -hmm. on, sorry. please? So just That's okay. that, thank you so much with the principles online. I'm wondering if there are um, any items that have been ordered that have not come in. And if there are any major items um, that need to be done before either protocols or practices or, or um, things that even, even just sort of facilities related um, issues that are not completed yet um, that need to happen before the start of school. I can speak to that. Not not at the middle school. Diane did mention that um, tents have come in and the tents will be put up. So that's just what we're waiting for is the tents to be up. I would echo that. The tents we're waiting on. Um, Wentworth also has car tags on order for families that won't be here in time for the first day. Um, and then the cameras for the technology piece of it. So um, I think Don is going to speak to that pretty soon. Yeah, I think it's the same at the K2 schools as it is at um, the bigger schools. You know, there's still a few last minute things that are on order and that we're hoping to have in, but we can print names on a piece of paper and give them to parents or they can use a magic marker and a piece of paper to write their name on for the pickup line before we get our more formalized uh, process in place. But I think, you know, tents are going in and I think things are looking really good. Is, is, is there any PPE that's missing? No, we have um, every piece of PPE that was promised has been delivered. Um, and, you know, everybody's, you know, missing the exact same item, um, but none of that would prevent us from being able to open school next week. So we are ready and excited to see our kids. Thank you. Sue, anything that you want to add or are you good? Can you come to the microphone so that people can hear you at home? Thank you. Good evening. The high school would be similar. The tents um, are coming and we are waiting for the cameras, but all the PPE is in as of today. Um, we've delivered um, two masks for every student. 
to their A East location with their handbooks and their student profile sheets. So those are ready for um, distribution on the first day. Um, and we got this, the plexiglass screens um, at the major office areas today. Those were installed. So I think we're in good shape with all the PPE and those kinds of things. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm wondering if this is a good time to bring Don in to talk about the technology. So I'm just going to go back to our slide deck here. And I think Don is He's on. In. I saw his name there. But we're going to keep our principals there, too. So then that way, as yes. we work through the rest of this, if there are questions, um, you know, we just have them on. Don, are you oh, with us? Evening. Thanks, yep. Don. Um, so, uh, good evening. It sounds like you've had all kinds of discussion about other things. I'll keep this really brief. Um, first thing I wanted to do was uh, follow up. I've done some trainings with the high school and middle school teachers this week. Um, and next week and the following week, I'll be doing some work in the elementary schools. Um, I wanted to show you the camera package that we're still waiting to come in. We ordered these at the end of June, and unfortunately, they haven't reached us yet. They were supposed to be here two weeks ago, um, but um, we're kind of a small fish in a big pond is what I've been alluding to for everybody. Um, the, this is the camera. comes in a little box, little kit. Um, when you open it up, um, it's... Just a little camera. Looks like this. Um, it's got a little leg. You can clip it on the top of this, uh, on top of the um, laptop screen. Um, you can also, if you look carefully, it's got a little screw hole in it, and you can connect it to the tripod. So each teacher will get a camera and a tripod. They'll also get um, a little bag that's got a 10 foot extension cable so that they can get it away from their desk and get it further out. Um, I've been, like I said, I've been doing some training with the, um, at the middle school today and the high schools yesterday. Um, got some really good feedback and some nice emails from people um, following those trainings. So um, just wanted to put that uh, to rest. That's what we're waiting for. The only purpose for this camera is to um, relieve the teachers from having to use the camera and microphone that's on that's built into their laptop. Give them a much better quality camera and microphone so that while they're teaching, whether it's in their classroom or remotely, they have more flexibility to move around in their classroom. Um, and even when they go home, they can do that. So whether they're teaching in class they're teaching a, a hybrid class or if they're teaching remotely or if we have to send all teachers home and they're all teaching remotely like we did in the spring. Everyone has one and they simply put it in their bag and take it home. Um, but it's not a it's not something super fancy with, you know, automation or anything like that. The nice thing about the camera is it will track you. It's got a very wide view. It will track some movement so that it'll it'll keep trying to focus on you as you move around. It's got a very good microphone system built into it. So it will work with all of the kids in the classroom, um, but it'll also noise cancel out a lot of the background noise. So kids moving around and clunking their chairs against the desk and stuff like that. Um, Diane, would you want to throw the slide back up? Um, let's go back to the yep. other one, please. Sure. So uh, I wanted to point out two things. A lot of school districts, I have a lot of peers around the country that, I'm, that, that I've had relationships with over the years. So I've reached out to many of them, and I'm finding that um, a lot of school districts didn't have the opportunity to go out and purchase a, you know, external cameras and mics and stuff like that. They're still using their laptops. But because we got some really good feedback from teachers in the spring and also from the start committee over the summer that I participated in, that's the way that was what formed the basis of making the decision to go ahead and take this leap um, and try to provide that equipment to teachers. 
Um, we hope to, that it will improve the learning experience, both for teachers and students. Um, again, I apologize it had, that we haven't been able to get them in, um, but they, as I said, we were, we were hoping they would be in and we were pretty sure they would be. We'll, we should have them in before the middle of September. Uh, next slide. So far though, uh, what we've accomplished, uh, my team and I, and keep in mind I have four technicians in the schools. Those four technicians have um, completed the acceptance and distribution of uh, 1,800 new laptops. Those were for K2 and, and nine through 12 students. 70 laptops that we got out to the K2 staff right before the pandemic um, forced us to send everyone home. Um, we've then taken all the laptops back that were sent out uh, for the spring. Um, so now we're up to 3,400 laptops and we've refurbished all of those, cleaned them up, sanitized them, um, put all the software back where it belonged and we are in the progress of distributing those. I'm sure you've seen some of the messaging um, uh, for the dis different distributions for different schools. Um, we have also purchased 2,200 more laptop cases because with this expectation that every student has a laptop taken at home, um, we've had to step up our game as far as putting the equipment in a safe position for students to carry around. So we ordered laptop cases for the K-5 students, which we haven't had to do in the past because they stayed in a cart in the classroom. Um, I put little ETAs or, or where we're at out to the side there. Um, I didn't put any specific dates because every time I do, it changes. <laughs> so I gave up. Um, we also, uh, as you can see, we've purchased 350 cameras, tripods and extension cables. That is the sum total of the little camera package. Um, we've purchased 140 document cameras for the K-5 classrooms. Um, and those are designed to, to go in and standardize the document cameras, which are pretty much used almost daily at the K-5 level. Um, we had a whole variety of different brands and years and stuff like that um, at that level. So what we decided to do was to use some of the um, funds that were available through the COVID funds. Now, we've had a, now we have a good base of document cameras that are standard K-5. We're going to take all of the ones that are still in life cycle, so they're not obsolete yet or anything, and we're going to move those into the middle school and high school to supplement what they already have that are still in life cycle. So that's going to bounce the number of document cameras way up in middle school and high school. And just in the last few days where I've had a chance to talk with staff at those two schools, um, I've found out that we do actually have um, a lot more interest in document cameras where we previously haven't. Um, keep in mind K2 uh, and 3.5, the document cameras are assigned to every single classroom. Middle school and high school, it's a um, first come, first serve. If you want it, you can go down to the library and check it out. Um, and then the last thing we did is we, we got a lot of good feedback from parents um particularly uh as well as students um in the k5 uh arena and so what we did is we implemented clever we had started a pilot of this right before the uh, pandemic started mm -hmm. so now we've rolled it out completely through k5 and what it is is it's a little portal students can um use a little badge that we're handing out with the laptop for k5 students they just hold the badge up in front of the camera and they just do this and it's got a little QR code on it. And um, if I'd been smart enough, I would have brought one with me. Um, so anyways, they hold it up and it logs them straight into the portal and all the applications that they would typically use with their classroom um, are logged in automatically. They don't have to remember their username and password. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, that system doesn't work with every single piece of software, but we've got well over 300 pieces of software that teachers are using. We focused on the top 10 or 12. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's about it. 
Any questions? Dawn, can you speak to the platform? Um, because again, it's great to see that that um, you know that that we've got these cameras and that are coming and a tripod. And you mentioned that right now teachers can continue to use their lap their laptops and the cameras on those devices. But you can you speak to um, you know what is the platform that teachers are expected to use? How they'll interface? Um, you know, with students who are at home? Oh, yeah. So uh, as we did this spring, um, teachers and staff were uh, using Google Meet and they would set up a, a session and the students that were remote could log into that session. They would get an invite and they would click on the link and it would take them in. Very similar to Zoom. In fact, at this point, Google Meet and Zoom are almost identical. Okay. Um, and so the platform um, that we're going to use would continue to be Google Meet. Um, the students at uh, particularly grades 6 through 12 and some within the uh, grades 3 through 5 will have access to Google Classroom as well. Um, and the, the teachers and the students can collaborate within that platform and they would be able to do very similar to what we're doing in the meeting tonight. They would have a shared screen. They could use a document camera at the same time and they, they could show the work that's on the desktop. They would simply switch from the electronic uh, document that they have, like the agenda that you, or the slideshow that you see, and they would switch to the view that shows the, what the document camera is looking like or looking at. They could then switch to the camera view um, so that the they could get more engaged with a student. There's a lot of different ways that you can mix and match this. I kind of look at it as playing with your granimals. Um, if anyone remembers that, uh, just kind of mix and match everything up um, and whatever fits, that's what you use. Um, but uh, I think it's really important for our teachers to remember that this is something that a lot of it is we've already done it really well in the spring. They did a fantastic job making the adaptations on the fly. All we're really doing is we're adding a little, we're, well, it's not all we're really doing, but we're adding some complexity because we have classrooms where students are in front of the teacher. And I guess you could say technically they're behind the teacher because they're gonna be, they would be able to put them on, uh, they would be able to show them on the projector. But they're using the same platform, Google Meet. Um, we've, we're working to get them a better camera so that they're not having to sit right in front of their laptop. Um, they've got an entire classroom to worry about. So this way they've got some more mobility. The camera that we are getting, by the way, will allow them, will track a little bit so that they can move around more, they can be more responsive to the kids in the classroom. Sammy. Dawn, I, I'm curious to know as you, I mean, really it's about teaching and learning that's fundamental mm -hmm. to our work. And as you were working with, you know, let's say the high school staff or any other staff, you know, the anxiety of some of this stuff can, can be an obstacle, but I'm curious to know you know, what did you learn? What went well? And, you know, are there areas that we should go deeper with to help support the staff? Well, certainly uh, one thing I learned and I, I anticipated it just because I've worked with instructional technology for so long is that um, there is a high level anxiety. Um, and I think we all anticipate that. Um, but what I also found is that there's, um, pretty much, I wouldn't say universally, but pretty much uh, very open, uh, very large amount of openness to um, exploring what we, what we can, how we can do this better. What does that kind of continual improvement slope look like? Um, I, did, I did get a very strong sense in each session that I did in both schools that um, when I say things like go slow to go fast, uh, that people are very receptive to that. And I think that's a message that we need to continue to focus on is, uh, that there's no expectation that everybody, you know, hit all cylinders right out the door. 
That's not what we're, that's not what we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on doing one or two things really well. And then next week we can do three things really well. Um, one of the, one of the, um, one facet of our work going forward though, that we're going to have to focus on is, uh, making sure that we have some re reliable support for teachers, um, where they can, um, as they have their breaks in the day, generally planning time or, um, before or after school that we can do um, some little mini trainings or just question and answer sessions. Hey, this came up. I was wondering, uh, can I, how do I blend these two things together so that I can be more effective? Uh, not only philosophical, but practical. Um, and I think we need to, we need to find a way to approach that maybe a little differently than we have in the past where it's not quite so formal. Thank you. You're welcome. Don, I have a question. Um, you had mentioned about the better um, microphone and the cameraing with these new systems. While mm -hmm. we're waiting for those to arrive and optimistically middle of September, but again, knowing mm -hmm. that technology is at a premium right now, um, what is the range for the microphone that's in the um, laptops as well as are there any tricks as far as muting the students' background noises so that the folks who are remote can hear better? Uh, well, uh, you definitely have, um, you've kind of hit the, on the problem um, dead on here, that the microphone for the laptop, um, as well as the camera, uh, is designed for someone to be pretty much right in front of it. Um, and this is where I would caution that we all recognize that right up front. Uh, the, the microphone was not built to be, san uh, noise canceling. So, um, luckily a lot of the classrooms will have, will have half the number of students in the class and they'll have good separation. So that will cut down on some of the background noise. Um, teachers, until we can get the external cameras in and distributed, um, we'll have limitations placed on kind of how much movement uh, they can exercise uh, in front of their classroom. Um, but I think that the um, issues with the, with the sound um, will be uh, more, more minimized because of the nature of the class, small class size, widely distributed, and um, the fact that uh, the other half of the class is remote. And so by being closer to the screen, um, at least temporarily, it gives the teacher a chance to, um, to kind of break into that transition from, I was only working with my students in a remote sense. Now I'm doing that hybrid. I think it's gonna give teachers some comfort to not have to walk away from their laptop on day one. I think I'm going to hold my follow up for a moment. Um, I don't know if anyone else has a question. I'm not trying to be a naysayer in any way, shape or form. I will say I'm a little bit concerned about um, tying a teacher to their desk in order for the students at home to hear them. It doesn't feel natural. Um, it also doesn't feel as though the students in the classroom are going to get the same interactions that I think I had envisioned in my mind. So it's for me trying to get my head back around this piece, um, really trying to stay positive on it. I'm just, I'm kind of curious. I mean, is there an option for, um, you know, I use Google Meets at my work and I can record a session. Is that an opportunity that we can record them? Again, not ideal, but so if somebody misses something or there's an audio quality that they can't hear, that they can watch it at a later time? Yes, and I, those are both great points. Um, I've had a number of questions uh, from uh, individual teachers. Can I record um, suggestions that I've made um, run 
um, from anywhere from you could do a brief introduction video. Um, you could use that to introduce um, the lesson or the concept to be taught. Uh, you can have that play uh, and your in class and remote students see the same thing, or you can kind of break it up and you use, you do the in class teach. You have the video available for the students and then you can um, kind of break it into two groups and you can kind of go back and forth between the two. Um, you can also record your lesson um, and have it available in Google Classroom um, for uh, future review. Um, there, I have heard some uh, concerns expressed uh, about um, recording an entire lesson. Um, I think that there's some complications there to, to be considered. And one is that that's a long period of time to be um, quote unquote on stage. Mm -hmm. um, in kind of a, uh, an unbroken uh, manner. Um, the, the microphones on the laptops, you can get, you know, five, six, seven feet away. Um, the microphones on the external camera, you can get 30 to 35 feet away. So, uh, but you're talking about two completely different technologies. Um, and so when we selected that external camera, the sound and the ability to, to move about the classroom freely uh, was a con strong consideration for the actual camera we selected. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, before we move on any further, noticing the time, and based on our policy, um, not able to do new business after 9.30, I'm requesting a... Um, Motion to extend the meeting beyond our 9.30 timeline. So moved. Second. And if we can just go straight to vote. Yep. Mrs. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Moving on from technology, um, we have uh, a hybrid and remote learning update to share with you. I believe Monique is going to kick this off, um, but certainly, again, um, we have our school leaders here as well that can offer um, information as you need. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, back in, it was actually August 20th, I met with two committees on that day, both curriculum, a K-12 curriculum group and a K-12 SEL group, where we had representatives, teacher leaders from across all phase levels. And we worked together to establish and clarify some curriculum guidance this year. As you recall, back in last March, we had about a week to turn everything around upside down um, and create um, as much learning as we possibly could in March. Um, so this year I'm feeling much better, much more confident in terms of guidance for teachers um, around the curriculum with the input from teachers and they are continuing to work with their colleagues on that. Um, in regard to our guiding principles, our folks felt that this year would be a great year to focus on helping our students to develop and become clearer, more effective communicators and more self-directed and lifelong learners as well. Our focus this year from our strategic planning perspective is providing safe and inclusive learning environments. And as you can see, we all care very much about that. Um, that's been completely the topic of discussion this, throughout this evening. In terms of content areas, um, our teachers are very ambitious with learning goals for our students. And uh, I really am charging them to take a look at um, the absolute essential half of their learning goals and to begin there. We talked a lot about the notion of what would be life worthy and what would be foundational for our students in this year. And another organizers for those teachers who wanna follow up on the recommendations made by the DOE and supported by the academic committee was um, using essential questions to develop some integrated projects 
And so we're going to um, parallel the essential question that the main DOE um, it also is using, uh, which is how do I interact with and impact my world as a global citizen? And the DOE will be providing um, some teacher developed integrated projects that our teachers can access. Those will be available, I believe, September 8th or 9th. Next slide, please. So just to give you a sense, although many of these have been um, touched upon today, our um, building and district leaders, and that includes teacher leaders, have been collaborating over the past month um, in terms of we have been busy hiring and orienting new staff, fielding and addressing staffing survey quest results, uh, as well as responding to parent survey results. Uh, we've been working on developing and adjusting school schedules um, based on student and staff needs. Know that it is fluid in nature. We're still getting parent requests and our principals are still working with our parents to make sure that their, their child's needs are being met. Uh, schedules are being developed uh, <clears throat> and we are um, making sure that we will be honoring um, as much planning time as we can. Certainly uh, the minimum is the teacher contract for planning, whether teachers are teaching in hybrid or whether they're um, remote learning. Uh, the calendar change that the school board did is gonna be very, very helpful in having those Wednesday afternoons to add to that planning time, as well as October 9th. And as you may um, recall, the high school also has November 3rd as well for additional time for this planning. Um, leadership is involved with coordinating with facilities around furniture and supplies. You heard quite a bit about that today. Um, but we've also been involved in coordinating with, with HR in terms of our staffing and needs and requests, transportation, special services, nutrition, IT, et cetera. Um, but specifically with teacher leaders and department chairs, they've been involved, teachers have been involved in designing those teacher days, um, the first through the third. You'll well, may hear more about that from the curriculum committee update later on today. And the initial student days. Um, the K2s have designed a day that works well for their students. And know that um, on Tuesday, third grade, third graders, sixth graders, and ninth graders will be in session. Wednesday will be a half of a remote day. And then Thursday, Friday will be the cohort B students arriving. So we do have a week, a gentle week from which to begin. In my conversations with teachers um, over this past week, um, I was suggesting look at the first two weeks as gentle weeks, weeks to ease in. And I'll talk a little bit about all the things that need to happen in those first few weeks for this new thing we called school to be effective for our students. So we've been coordinating activities and resources. Um, <clears throat> but we've also been actively participating, preparing for students as well. I grabbed this shot of a um, bulletin board outside of a classroom at Wentworth School. Um, certainly health and safety guidelines and protocols um, in this new school thing we're going to do for school this year um, is going to take some time and some practice. It's not gonna happen on the first day of school. It's not gonna happen in the first week of school. Um, habits take time to form and there will need to be gentle reminders to everyone, adults and students alike, <clears throat> within the buildings. We also have um, resources, again, on order, similar um, piece arriving sometime in, in September, but we had a group of leaders uh, come together and put together, pull from that, um, the few copies we have in the district to put a remote learning one-on-one together. Uh, and one of the pieces within that that was very powerful was teachers need to take care of themselves before they can take care of their students. So we're working quite a bit on developing some supports for teachers along the way um, in terms of, and that will be part of those activities will be come from the SEL committee as well. So in organizing our curriculum work, we really do want to focus on the social and emotional learning pieces for both staff as well as students in our first month of school. We're also gonna be working on prioritizing those goals and then communicating those to our families so they can help support the learning of our students. Our folks have been busy preparing classrooms, drafting schedules and um, participating in that professional learning as well. So what we'd like parents and guardians to know 
Um, if they haven't already figured this out, we have a very dedicated staff of professionals and they want to do a very good job, an excellent job with students. They want to do their best. They have high standards and they should have high standards. And this is part of the anxiety. In my conversations with staff this past week, one of the things I heard was a worry. And one of those worries was, parents are going to expect more than I can provide this next week and in the next couple of weeks. I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm trying to do this to the best of my ability and the time that's available, but I'm afraid that it's just not going to be good enough in the first week. And what we'd like parents to know, um, or we'd ask of parents is to be patient in these first months. We really need to focus on our staff making connections with students. It's less about the academics. Um, we really wanna lay the foundation for learning. We want the, our teachers to be to develop strong relationships with their students and that's going to take time in this new environment. Our students are going to be busy learning new norms, routines and procedures, whether they're in person or remote. And so our students have not been on site for quite some time. And our sites, our school sites, as you notice with the plexiglass and the PPE and the face masks, it's going to be different and it's going to take some time. We also are going to go through some glitches, very similar to how in the um, town hall chambers there, you're going through some glitches in working <laughs> with a new technology. We need to let our teachers know that's okay. Parents understand that. We're all learning and we're gonna continue to learn as this year moves along. We also want our teachers to be observing students, looking at the work that they are doing and what they can and might be ready for. The academics will come, but we want our parents to know that all learning is social and emotional. And if our students aren't ready for that learning, um, it's not going to happen anywhere. Um, anyway, uh, as I shared with uh, groups of staff, as I was presenting to them over this past week um, and last week, I said, you know, I can teach an AP calculus class to any group of first graders. They may not learn a thing, but I could sure teach it. And what we want, what we're looking for is our students actually learning. Um, and we want them to develop a depth of understanding rather than a breadth of coverage. Um, we want our students to be able to transfer what they learn this year to new situations. That's part of that lifelong learning. So <clears throat> those are the pieces that teachers have asked me to communicate to our um, community. Um, and uh, I, happy to entertain any questions or um, if principals feel that I've left anything out or messages that they would like to share, um, please join in. Sarah. Monique, uh, thank you for that. It was really good to hear, I think. Um, and this, apologies if I missed this, but uh, is there plans, if we haven't done so already, to send out a communication to parents to that effect? Uh, so yes. That's just like very explicitly that and not a lot of other things as well? Yes, I'm, um, I've got a draft of a curriculum update that I can certainly send out early next week. Okay, thanks. Um, Monique, thank you. I would say that you just shifted me 180 degrees. Um, that was great. I think it was a great reminder um, for everyone as we go through the process. So thank you. Nick? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I, I was very impressed and, and almost moved by your focus on empathy and on social emotional learning and about patience during this. I think that's so important. I mean, you know, it's, it's been challenging as a board member over the summer to tweak our calendar and to reduce our number of student days. and. And I think it's also important to realize that, that it's going to take time in a couple of weeks or maybe even longer than that to get up to some amount of speed where we can expect, um, you know, our schools to start kind of chugging along. And we heard something similar like of that uh, at our last board meeting when our school uh, physician talked about how it took some time for his staff to get acclimated, but it did happen and they got used to their new norm and we know it will happen. Um, but you'd be, I agree with Leanne in the chair. You, you, you turned me to, to really focus on the empathy of the situation as opposed to ratcheting through cameras and microphones and all of that technological stuff. 
um, because that's at the heart of what we're doing and the heart of what our students need. So thank you. Any other questions? So I'm going to go back to our slide deck, and I believe uh, the next piece that we wanted to give you an update on was athletics and activities. So um, Mike Legage, our activities director, is here this evening, and so he could um, provide you with an update. Well, thank you. First of all, I'll say that um, we've worked really hard and, and over a long period of time on our web page. So I'd, I'd really encourage you to take a look at our COVID page. And we've really outlined all our processes there. And especially um, one of the tabs that's entitled Stay Informed, it lays out kind of a chronology of things. So I'm going to try to give you like five months and five minutes here so um and certainly can um come back at another time and have a broader discussion um, but you can also look at that web page and see everything so um the main principals association got to got their committees together for fall sports every fall sport has a committee um along with the Sports Medicine Committee and the Interscholastic Management Committee. So all those groups got together and formed um, the, created the, the documents um, for each sport or the guidelines they call them for each sport. Those guidelines were a synthesis of all of the different rules that are out there, CDC rules, DOE rules, our responsibility is really to follow the MPA guidelines because that's the synthesis of everything. Um, and so those groups were working on that. They were, they had in recent months, they were told that they can use the community sport guidelines, which if anybody reads the newspaper in the last, I don't know, two months probably, there's been a article about high school athletics on the front page that kind of walks you through things too. But probably a month or so ago, they got word that um, we don't have to follow the DOE guidelines, we can follow the community sport guidelines. And so they created the documents um, using those sport guidelines and then submitted those to the governor and the various commissioners of um, some of the different branches, the Department of Human Services, um, the Department of Economic and Community Relations, um, and some other agencies uh, that they had to submit to. And those departments came back um, and sent, sent a letter back and were pretty critical of the sport guidelines and, and what, what they had established. Um, and then, uh, interesting enough, the community sport guidelines were then reissued. Um, so they kind of changed the rules. Uh, so it's, it's back to the drawing board, um, except uh, the governor has, um, you know, made a push to have her commissioners work with the MPA and the main school boards association and superintendents association to work collaboratively on putting these guidelines together or re, re, really reworking them. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now. To be able to do that work, they want to extend the season, the opening of the season another week. So the original plan was to start September 8th, Tuesday. They've pushed that to September 14th to allow this time to take a second look at um, the individual sport guidelines. I also will mention the, the categorization because that was a major change in the reissuing of the community sport guidelines. They recategorized many of the sports um, risk level. And so uh, that, was, that was a big change. So I just put on there, th there's many, many, many more um, they categorized everything. I just, you know, pulled out the fall ones um, to put on this slide. 
But obviously the low risk sports are those things that would be very simple to do. More individual sports wouldn't require cleaning in between things and sanitizing and those things. And then that amps up, of course. And so um, they are talking about the possibility of, of low and moderate risk sports being able to happen um, and maybe deferring you know, the higher risk sports. But those are still, it's all still under consideration and we're gonna kind of wait and see how it all fetches out. So where does that leave us um, right now? Um, we could, you know, go into phase four um, and do the strength and conditioning and those things and start that next week. Um, we really felt um, in Scarborough anyways, that the best course of action for us is next week to start team informational meetings and workshop sessions for our, our student athletes. And so what we would do, what that would look like in, in practice is about a 90 minute time um, that we'd have with the kids. Um, and our office would take about 30 minutes of that time and actually walk kids through the whole process. So the bell rings at 220, here's what you're gonna do next and physically walk through the whole thing. This is where your checkpoint is for this sport. This is what that means. Um, and this is how we can do the locker rooms and this is where you go to wait if there's too many in the locker room, all those things. So we're actually gonna kind of walk through the whole process with kids. We got a lot of feedback from coaches that they were concerned about how are they going to get all that information to the kids before Tuesday. And so that's why we can't, we, we've decided in Scarborough anyways to take a step back and use next week to do those kind of informational workshop sessions, um, really in terms of a safety step um, and, and a help to the coaches to begin to start that process. And then we'd look to start September 14th um, and, and be ready for that. I think if you looked at our webpage, I feel very confident that we're ready to continue to move forward and, and have those pieces in place to be successful and be, and be safe. Um, I do bring up transportation and there's not a school board policy about this, but um, we, we may have to look at, you know, Sarah's pretty confident about our ability to transport um, kids um, if we're fortunate enough to be able to do that in some sports. But there's going to be that, um, there may be that time where we have to let parents know that transportation might not be available in some instances. Um, my, our, our plan would be still that students would not be allowed to transport themselves. Um, but in some instances we may have to say, okay, we're gonna have the golf match on this day and it's going to be at this location and we're not providing transportation for that. We, we gotta meet you there. We'll know that well ahead of time so parents can plan. It won't be the day of. Um, I'm hoping it won't be the day of, you never know, because depending on who's in or out for bus drivers and who calls in sick and you know all those things can change stuff. I think we'll still have the opportunity to do some contract buses um, and, uh, and go from there. So there's a lot of other information. That's kind of where we're at in a nutshell. Questions? Oh, I have plenty. Um, one of the pieces, I wa actually had watched the MPA meeting. Mm -hmm. I was really excited and then not so excited. Um, but they had adjusted cheerleading. And I noticed it's back on here. Has that been changed and it is now back on the table as a sport for the fall? Um, no, um, it's on the table for us in Scarborough because we're, we're not gonna not do cheerleading if we do everything else. Awesome. And so we'll do something with our, with our cheer team. Um, I don't know what that something will be. It might look a little different, but we're not gonna exclude our cheerleaders. It might also mean that we have to, we'll work with our cheer coach who is wonderful and um, maybe adjust some of the things that they're allowed to do um, during their cheering um, to keep within the guidelines, but we're not going to not um, provide that opportunity for our kids in Scarborough. Now, 
I was at, a, at our league meeting today, and that was the sentiment of a lot of the athletic administrators in our in the south southwestern main activities associations, the SMA, the 17 schools that make up our league. Thank you. I, that that is great news that it's back for us. Um, something else that has been talked about a lot is regionalization mm -hmm. of classes instead of the usual class A, class B. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, they have started regionalizing schedules. For example, we'll play Cape Elizabeth. Um, we don't normally play them in every sport. We, we will. Um, and so they've begun to think about some geographic location. The issue is going to be competitiveness too. And so um, there would be some schools that wouldn't make sense for us to play. It would not be, um, it, it just would not be a great experience. And so, um, so what they did was as, as best they could regionally, they tried to put a schedule together. It's substantially reduced. I mean, they're talking probably around eight games um, for soccer, field hockey, um, and then um, probably around five, if, you know, if we do football, it'll be around five games. Um, ab about, uh, I think it's four matches um, for, I have it written down on this document, four matches, five golf matches, four cross country matches, five football games, um, and then eight volleyball, eight soccer and eight field hockey is what they're talking about right now in um, their schedule. And they, and they have reissued those and, and they are more regionalized. They're not really worrying about class A, B, because if we do a tournament in any of those, it's an open tournament. And so um, during the regular season, it doesn't really matter who we play. It's not a heel point thing. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I just wanted to actually jump on something that um, Leanne had mentioned because I'm actually looking. Um, I'm looking right now as I'm speaking at the at the governor's kind of um, at the governor the administration's uh, community sports guidance. And so, as I understand it, the regionalization of sports has the biggest impact on the moderate risk, right? Because that's the group that they're starting to allow inter low risk. They have you can do inter school or competition between schools. Moderate, you can if it's outside and it's regional. The high risk, according to what I'm reading here, they're still saying they want to keep that basically level one, two, or three, so within team competitions. Are they looking to, to, uh, to edit that and open it back up between schools? I thought that had been shut down. I may be dated. I, th I think that that's still kind of the plan, is that okay. they're looking at the lower risk sports you could compete um, you know, with, with teams, um, not just within your own county. Um, and so in, in the SMA, there's more than, it's more than just Cumberland County schools. So like golf, for example, we'd probably still be able to maintain our game matches against teams like Marshwood, Noble, um, Sanford, those schools, um, and, and, and Lewiston. If we if we had a if we had a match with them, but um, as you advance up that or down that list there, that regionalization becomes more significant. They really are looking towards not going out of Cumberland County or in the high risk sports, only allowing you to do internal sorts of things. So, like um, if they don't offer, say, football during the regular season because it maintains a high risk, they'll still allow the school to do football and we'd be able to do internal um, activities, you know, amongst ourselves, a seven on seven league, an internal seven on seven league, something like that. Um, but kind of, you know, I guess the um, more common um, term for that would be more intramural type program um, as you kind of go down that list. Thank you. Yep. Max? Um, I have a question regarding activities yeah. and like meetings. Yeah. So with mm -hmm. two different cohorts, how is that going to work with a, like 
take Key Club, for example, they only meet on Tuesdays. Yeah. Are people in cohort B going to come in for a club meeting on Tuesday? Yeah, so right now what I've been doing is I've been slowly meeting with all the club advisors. And so, like, for example, we met with the math team um, the other day, and, and we're going to, at least in, until, um, you know, and, and probably through um, the first semester is our plan is to try to keep the groups within their, their school cohort groups. And so that's going to mean that um, you could do a virtual meeting if you want to meet with everybody at the same time, or they would do more than one meeting a week if you want to do in person. Um, but right now the thought is that we would try to maintain the cohort groups um, with the club programs at least through the start of school. So we've met with the math team and we met with student council and started talking about well, what is Spirit Week going to look like now? Because we're obviously not going to have a, uh, an assembly day like we normally have, but could we do some other things? Could we still, could we go back to the days when I first started of going back to doing the penny wars and the dressing up and those sorts of things that we could still do and, and, and entice some school spirit, but um, it probably would not culminate in a assembly. Um, because we wouldn't be able to do that. So we're starting to talk about those things. Um, we have, excitingly enough, we have booked the prom, the, the venue for the prom already. Um, so we're anticipating, um, you know, hopefully being able to do that in May. Um, I believe May 15th is our date for that, um, if that's a Saturday. And um, that's just, a, just <laughs> off my memory, but and uh yeah 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 so we're um we're start you know i'm i'm slowly we're doing it a little differently um because more of the rules um with the club programs are going to be more of our internal things we're not like in athletics it's really governed by a lot of out, outside groups mm -hmm. um we don't have a lot of say in things. We just have to make sure we can follow the rules. Um, but with the club programs, we're, we're we've kind of creating those. So we're going to meet with that. We've been talking with our Oak Hill Players Director and working on um, what a virtual performance might look like. And so we've um, been planning that. I've been talking with the One Act Play person um, advisor as well we've been talking about what that might look like they it looks like they've already decided not to have a one act play competition statewide that's kind of already been decided but they've they've talked about um, would people would schools uh, participate in a virtual experience that wouldn't be scored but would be an opportunity um, to perform and so that's kind of what we're looking at with the one act play so I'm slowly meeting with we have over 30 clubs. I'm slowly meeting with those advisors as we come back to school and kind of figuring. I've asked them all not to have meetings with, their, with the students until we've had an opportunity to connect. In-person meetings. They can do anything they want virtually. Okay. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank this you. is great news. Um, before we move into the chair's report, I just want to say thank you to all the administrators for um, pulling this together. This, is, this was a lot that got done in two very short weeks, um, or maybe very, very long weeks, given the hours that people put in. Um, so thank you. Um, really appreciate the overview that we had tonight. And I just wanted to open it up to see if overall if there were any questions that the board had before we moved on. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm going to feel really bad. Um, oh, hold on. April? Sorry, I raised my blue hand slow. Um, if everyone else is ready to move forward and move on from the conversation, um, I certainly don't want to um, create some kind of 
cycle or circle where I'm just talking and, and everyone else is ready to move on. But uh, I can't help but comment on the fact that once again, this week, we are finding ourselves in a position um, as a board of trying to manage some um, I, I don't know the right words, honestly, guys. Uh, just some some statements from our teachers and some concerns. Um, and we received, I counted roughly 40 emails today um, expressing a lot of anxiety and, and asking us to, at the very least, discuss um, altering our start day for the schools. Um, I know negotiations met to impact bargain um, with the SEA yesterday, which really, I, to me, you know, those are closed door conversations. Um, and so I struggle a little bit also with the fact that many of the emails that we got today um, referred to a board sentiment that delaying the start of school was not in the best interest of the students. That can't possibly be a board um, sentiment. We, we did not discuss that publicly. Um, and so it's hard to hear, you know, it, myself quoted back to me as a board member um, in email after email from teachers. I don't know where they're getting that information from specifically. Um, but I do feel like that this is something we need to address as a board. Um, you know, I don't know if it's a communications breakdown. Um, I don't know if it, and I'm not going to speculate um, as to whether it's a communications breakdown or whether it's something more. Um, but I do think that it's becoming a theme where I feel like we have something in front of us um, that builds and builds and builds up to our meetings. And then we have this amazing administration team that spends the next three hours kind of laying out a different path, you know, a different set of information. And I, I don't know how to reconcile all of what we've heard over the last three hours. And this is not the first week that this has happened to us. Okay. So what I'm about to do, I'm going to be very, I'm going to be as tactful as I can possibly be because April's right. What happens in, in negotiation conversations is, is private. Um, but I will say this, um, in our conversations, when some of the things we heard in public comment were brought up, uh, the idea about starting school next Tuesday and the concerns were, were, very, were very prominent and very obvious. And um, what the negotiations team did leave that meeting with was, was some very specific feedback to the SEA folks that were in the room that we weren't comfortable recommending a delay or a change in the calendar without more information. And so we made that very, very clear that if there was going to be a message distributed to the SEA membership, which they have every right to do, that we wanted to be sure that we, we weren't saying yes, we weren't saying no, we were saying not now because we didn't have enough information. And so that's why uh, Diane works so diligently with our, with our high school principals and with all the other uh, leaders and teachers around the district to go through kind of that checklist and, and kind of get an idea of exactly where we stood. Um, so I, I apologize if that seems covert. It's all been within 24 hours and that's tough. And, and Hillary's the chair of negotiations. So I'm, as I say this, I'm realizing I'm stepping all over her, which I'm sorry. Um, and if she wants to jump in, she certainly can. But um, certainly, you know, we know we can't speak for the whole board, and that's why we wanted to talk about it tonight, even though it wasn't officially on the agenda to talk about uh, those concerns. Um, they're obvious, they're prominent, and to ignore them would be uh, not doing them justice. So, so thanks, April, for pumping the brakes a little bit. And I hope I didn't, I hope I danced around that okay. But I, I felt the need to, to say that. Um, in no way did the negotiations team speak for the board at that meeting. Alicia? So th thank you for the clarification about the Is negotiations. No. Oh. Thank you for the clarification about um, that there was a negotiations meeting. I drew that inference based on the emails and um, the fact that many of the teachers emailed that they were told by the SEA to reach out to us. Um, about the school school start date, um, you know the emails varied. There were teachers in support of starting the school school times um, school date 
um, as scheduled. There are teachers who don't want to come back to school at all and, and you know, have their personal issues for, for that feeling. There are teachers that are worried about how they're going to, I think, anxiety in general about, are, am I going to do it well? Am I going to um, be ready? How am I going to manage this? There are teachers who said that they felt that we didn't have um, everything that they needed to be successful, and which is why I asked the questions that I asked tonight um, to try to determine if that was the perception of the school leaders or not. Um, I'm sure there are things that are being done right now. The question is, is it are the safety protocols in place for me? And, and do um, we have what we need for school to start safely? And I didn't hear any um, information that led me to believe that that was not the case. Um, and, you know, I got these emails while I was working today and, and unable to read them. And so I was reading them while the meeting was going on. It was very last minute and it was part of a coordinated effort. Um, and so that this was not on the agenda to, to first of all, address or then um, to change. And so I'm not sure how that message got out. Um, there, I'm concerned that the teachers are feeling that way and that they're feeling stressed. I also know how much work has been put into place to um, make sure that things are, are done and done well. And we've included so many experts and, and community members and uh, students, and I feel really good about that plan. And, um, you know, I'm sorry that people are feeling that way. I, I, I just feel like it's such a last minute um, communication that I don't feel comfortable unless if there was some sort of safety issue. I don't feel comfortable saying the entire town of Scarborough has prepared themselves and the kids are, have an expectation to come back to school. And now um, we're going to change that because I think that that would be devastating for them emotionally and problematic for uh, families to deal with. And I just, um, I'm, that's not something I can advocate for based on no people in attendance, no very limited information and, and all last minute and trying to rush and understand it. And, um, and partly based on what I view as misinformation. So um, that, that's where I am. Sarah? Yeah, I agree with everything Alicia said, and I think she said it probably better than I can, so I don't need to reiterate that. Um, I will just add a, a couple other thoughts, which is, you know, whenever there's a big decision like this, um, there are a lot of different ingredients. And one of those, you know, because this wasn't on the agenda and because it's right before school is supposed to start, there's a huge comp uh, component that we haven't considered or gotten feedback from, and that would be the parents in the community who are all expecting their kids to go to school on Tuesday. And so I think it's, I, I want to, I want the teachers to feel like we've heard them and we're listening. Um, but there, there are other elements that we haven't heard from. And at the end of the day, what Alicia said is, is true, which is the safety. And which is why we kept going, I kept going back to Diane about like the checklist, like is everything that you said was going to be there, that the DOE said should be there, that the CDC should be there, is, are all of those things in place? And if so, is it safe to go back to school? And I'm hearing that it is. And I think the other thing that I would, um, I, I know this provides no comfort at all to those who are feeling anxious about going back, but the thing that I just keep thinking about is like this framework is literally built to be agile. So if on Tuesday we go to school and Wednesday or Thursday we decide it's not working, we can adjust. We can make changes. We can pivot. Maybe Wednesday we go to school and there's an outbreak and we have to pivot. Or maybe we do it because it's just not working out. Or maybe everything's going to be fine. And so it, it's literally designed to be flexible. And I think we have to just remember that. And I think the point that I would just like the one major takeaway from this entire meeting is what Monique said, which is like, everyone just needs to have a little bit of grace and patience and, and compassion for everyone. Teachers, the students, students, the teachers, staff, parents, the, the whole lot. 
And, and I think we'll be okay if we can find a way to do that and then just trust in the framework. Kristen? I, yeah, I agree with what Alicia and Sarah have said. And I think to Sarah's point, back to what Monique was saying, because it changed a lot for me too, just to hear her words. But if there's something that we as a board can do, because we don't, teachers don't often have that kind of a communication to say to parents bear with us, like, we want to do right by your kids. So if we can somehow as a board find a way to communicate that better to our families or other things to support the teachers to, I don't know, because just so to ease their anxiety in some other way, even if it's not changing the start date of school, but something. Agreed. Um, and I guess my statement really rolls into the chair's report, um, which was, I apologize, I have not read all those emails. Um, I was working, um, really had very little time in between when my day ended and when I had to get here. Um, so I know that there's a lot to look at. Um, and I'm going to apologize if I haven't answered or asked the questions for some of them that came through. Um, Monique's statement really did it. I was going to talk about grace and patience. Um, you saw it tonight. It was a very different experience from our last meeting where I was the remote person trying to manage a meeting to being inside. And there's plus and minuses to both. Um, it's, it's a very different experience. And there were mistakes that were made. And there were things that were not um, smooth. And, you know, the patience is going to go always. Um, understanding that we're going to kind of get through this as we get through it and try to get better each time. Um, but knowing that it's not going to be run on Tuesday and all of a sudden it's homework and it's full lessons and we need to ease people back into this. And it'll get better with time. It won't be perfect. Um, I wish it was. Um, but just to Sarah's point as well, Agile hits home. You pivot. You make changes. You adjust as you need to and know that it will always improve as we go through this. Um, so yes, we need to make sure that we're communicating it better, whether it's um, blurbs that we're sending out or if it's in the superintendent's letter, um, the curriculum letter that Monique referenced. We really just need to make sure that everybody understands that this is gonna be, it's gonna take a little time before this is running smooth. Okay, all right, moving on to committee reports. Hillary, I don't know if this was supposed to be a deleted slide or if you wanted to share anything. Sorry, no, um, I don't have any updates from negotiations at okay. this time. Thank you. Alicia, policy was on. I don't know why it's on. I don't either. Okay. All right, no update. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. All right. In that case, we're moving into new business. Motion to approve the meeting minutes of July 16th, 2020, as presented. So moved. Second. And I think we, any discussion? All right, uh, Mrs. Durgan? Yes. Ms. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Okay. 9.2 is a donation approval, and I don't have any paperwork on that. I'm hoping that you do. We did not receive any paperwork. Okay. Um, motion to table 9.2, the donation approval until our next meeting. So moved. Second. And we can just go to straight vote on that. Mrs. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. 
Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Looks like 9.3 appointments. Okay. Middle School Social Studies and Digital Citizenship teacher, Christian Bertelsonson, has been chosen to fill this newly created position. Mr. Bertelsonson attended Colby College in Waterville where he earned his Bachelor of Arts degree. He recently completed the ETEP program at USM. As part of his internship with the ETEP program, he taught classes at Westbrook Middle School. Mr. Bertelsonson will be placed on step, step one of the bachelor's plus 15 scale per collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Christian Bertelsonson as a middle school social studies and digital citizenship teacher. If you want to do all of them at once, we can. Okay, thank you. High school science teacher, 9.3.2, James Harmon has been selected to fill this position created by a retirement. Mr. Harmon received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Biological Sciences from USM and will be completing his Master's degree in Biology shortly. Mr. Harmon has been a science teacher in several area schools since 2001, including Darren High School, Noble High School, Biddeford High School, and Sanford High School. Mr. Harmon will be placed on step 18 of the bachelor's plus 15 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint James Harmon as a high school science teacher. 9.3.3, Eight Corners School Behavior Specialist. Danielle Lindquist has been, not been nominated to fill this newly created position. Ms. Lindquist completed her undergrad study at the University of Vermont with a Bachelor of Science degree in education. She also earned her Master's of Education in Special Education from UVM. Ms. Lindquist has been involved with special education in elementary schools in Anchorage, Alaska for the over six years. Ms. Lindquist will be placed on step seven of the Master's plus 15 scale for the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Daniel Lindquist as the Eight Corners School Behavior Specialist. Okay. Um, bundling it as one, motion to approve as presented. So moved. Second. Mrs. Jurgen? Yes. Ms. G Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Excellent. Um, for 9.3.4, 9.3.5, 9.3.6, 9.3.7, 9.3.8, 10 and 11, we had received the documentation. Is everyone in agreement that we can accept as presented? So moved. Second. Thank you. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Excellent. Okay, and 10.0 is a motion to adjourn. Two. So moved. <laughs> Second. Thank you. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you.